Five Nights at Freddy's has been out for so long, and literally everyone has talked to death about it already. However, I don't really know much about the series. In fact, I have a very surface level knowledge. The only time I've ever played one of the games is eight years ago, in that video right there, where I made How Not to Play Five Nights at Freddy's 2, where I played it for 10 minutes, 10 seconds, and that's it. That's all I really know. I've tried watching game theories in the past. It always seems to escape me. So today, we're gonna learn as much as we possibly can from MatPat's game theory, Ultimate Timeline of FNAF. How much will we learn? Lots, hopefully. Take it away, Matt Today Pat. I'm we ready. End the torment. 19 Oof, God, books, finally. 11 games, 8 whole years. All leading to this moment. The 19 ultimate books. FNAF timeline is finally complete. The pieces are in place for us. Now all we have to do is put this story of tragedy, jealousy, and loss back together. Hello, Internet! Welcome I'm ready. to Game Theory, the show that feels like a kid revealing the class project that he's been working on all year. Except here, it's the class project that I've been working on for the past decade of my life. This one. We checked how many videos there were in this playlist before the stream started. It turns out that there are 59 Five Nights at Freddy's game theories, and he's not done yet. He is big, my friends, and I gotta admit, kind of nervous. I love it. I attempted it. I had to say. I am a big game theory fan. I enjoy it. I love the way it's presented. I love the effort that comes into all of these videos, considering they're on a weekly basis. I love how in-depth they are. Of course, they're not going to get everything right, but I think that that's fine because you wouldn't get everything right either. And if I wanted to just sit there and read a book on all the accurate law knowledge, I would go into a Reddit post about a person that had spent way too long, way too many hours in the basement typing out Five Nights at Freddy's Law. But I actually want to watch something pretty entertaining too. The timeline video Take on this a look franchise at this. since 2018. Back in the days when Mike was the crying child, Afton coming back was actually a surprise, and Fazgu wasn't a phrase I'd ever thought I'd have to utter. But since the last time I did something like this, we've had three more Fazgu games, the death and revival of the FNAF movie, and more robot kids than you can shake a staff bot at. It is exhausting trying to keep track of this whole franchise, which honestly is why I'm here today. The lore at this point is comp. Complicated. It is full of speculation and theory. So that's why I'm here, my pal. Easier for everyone, and to give us all a baseline to talk about this franchise moving forward into the future, it's time to reveal my current working FNAF timeline. But just before I do, I just want to. I love how all of this. He's gonna make like five videos on this timeline. All of this is just to have a baseline of. Okay, now we can talk about it. Now we can speculate a little bit. A of things. First, this timeline is. This is like Kingdom Hearts and Kirby all, all juiced into one thing. And Metal Gear. Throw Metal Gear into that Massive. as well. Seriously, it is huge. This thing towers over any video project we have ever done on the channel. But when you look at the totality of this franchise, the story of FNAF really boils down to the story of one man, William Afton. His successes, his Purple failures, guy. his rise to becoming co-owner of one of the most successful restaurant franchises in the world, and his eventual fall to the monsters he helped to create, only to then be reborn in a new digital form later. That's why I've decided to split this timeline into what? three main chunks. The foundation of Freddy's, how the business started and how it came into being, the Afton era, William's death. There's no way that a Freddy Fazbear's pizza that looks like that will become best selling franchises in the world. That makes no sense. Chuck E. Cheese, Nightmare Edition. Who's going to this? Who looks at Freddy Fazbear's pizza and they're like, ooh, seems like some family fun. Let's go over there and get a margarita pizza. Decades long murder spree and post purple guy. Basically modern FNAF. Everything that happens after the pizzeria simulator fire. Chuck E. Cheese is not that big. new big revelations in this thing that seemingly come out of nowhere, as well as just points I want to talk about further, I decided to dedicate one episode to each chunk. I originally wanted it to be one seamless continuous video, but it just felt incomplete without some sort of explanation at the end of each one. Once this whole thing's done, I promise I'm going to merge all the narrative bits into one massive video so you can just skip my explanations. But for now, this just felt like the best, most satisfying- Well, no, I need the explanation. So I'm glad that you did this. Most complete way to do also, this. Also, more like ad revenue. Said, this is still about the story, the broad strokes of the franchise. So in order to make sure that you guys know that I'm not just pulling answers out of thin air, not only am I discussing some of the more controversial bits at the end of each chunk, we're also putting in a handy little graphic in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, which will show thumbnails, video titles, books, and any other citations that we need throughout the video. So if you wish to 
understand. Did, did he just cite his own theory? That specific statement I in think more he did. detail, you know exactly where we've taken it from. That way you can look into those details for yourself. So sit back, grab some popcorn or your pitchforks if you're the type to get upset when I say something controversial and make sure- Oh, that's you, chat! I saw so many people like, my pet gets all of his theories wrong. There's so many incorrect uh, parts of this. It's like, well, the yeah, there might be incorrect parts of this, but there's gonna be incorrect parts of every theory. The entire idea behind a theory is that you are making things up as you go. Using evidence, using sources, and the best that you can cobble together, but you're making things up. Sure that you subscribe, since this is gonna be a video that you're gonna wanna come back to a few times in order to fully dissect. Without any more waiting, okay. I present to you the story of a loving, obsessive father who slowly descended into madness, and along the way, discovered the secret to eternal life. It's dressing up as a bunny, apparently. <laughs> Our story begins not in the 1980s, or even in the 1970s, but all the way back in the 1930s. It was the throes of the Dude, nothing good happened in the 1930s. I can think of one thing that happened in the 1930s. Wasn't that great. People were in desperate need of cheap entertainment, especially in Utah, one of the states hit hardest. Fourth highest unemployment There's like 15 the people in Utah. Transients. People looking for work in Salt Lake, finding none, and ultimately moving on to find their fortunes out in California. People were tired and they were hungry, but as they traveled, there was one thing that could lift their spirits. A simple roadside attraction called Fred Bear's Singin' Show. The ads were plastered all over town, featuring an Oh, this starts way earlier than I thought it did. eyed cartoon style for characters at the time. He resembled car- 50 cent general admission? I feel like that's high for 1930s. Like Mickey Mouse, Felix the Cat, Betty Boop. It immediately said that this, Fred Bear's, was a place where you could bring the family. And the price, honestly, couldn't be beat. For 50 cents- Oh, really? Never mind. And entertainment yep. as you walk- Oh, you get food? Never mind, just take it back. The local trained real life dancing bear perform on stage. Normally, you only got to see dancing bears at large traveling circuses like Barnum and Bailey, where the tickets would go for about a dollar. That's a dollar without food. But this was a smaller show. What a rip! A whole dollar? The type from the Von- With inflation, that's like $7,000. Or the Robbins brothers, where tickets would sell for just a mere 50 cents. Watching that bear do tricks on stage brought a glimmer of joy at a time when so much was wrong with the world. The simple- sh Knowing the series, they're probably gonna take the bear and strip it for parts after it dies and turn it into the Freddy Fazbear. The would go on for years, bringing happiness to hundreds of travelers passing through looking for a quick meal. But it left a permanent impression on one little boy, capturing his imagination in a way that nothing else had. One little boy named Billy. That was his nickname at least, but his parents like to call him William. William Afton. The bear his parents like to call him Purple Guy. Purple Guy Afton. It could sing. For decades, William dreamed of recreating that moment of bringing a musical bear to life, but how? William was smart, without a doubt, and he had a keen mind for business, but he wasn't the most creative. How do you make a singing, dancing bear come to life? The best he could do was using rudimentary costumes. William was inspired by the work of Walt Disney, who throughout the 50s and 60s was pioneering the use of mascot suits. Through how close to real life is the Five Nights at Freddy's lore? Is this actual real life? Is there a Disney? in the Five Nights at Freddy's law? Is this- <laughs> theme park. The big innovation, suits with five fingers. This allowed the performers wearing That's the an innovation. their natural arms and hands to interact with the guests, as opposed to the older models where the arms would just hang limply by their sides. Finally, with a simple mascot suit, he would be able to realize his childhood dream. He would be able to bring Fred Bear to life. To appeal to the kids, and for copyright reasons, he changed Fred Bear from a realistic brown animal to a cartoonish yellow bear with a purple hat and bow tie. But feeling like one character wasn't enough, he added another friend, a yellow rabbit with a purple vest and matching tie named Bonnie the Bunny. Well, Fred- Oh, I do not like him. He is not safe for work. Christ almighty, what's that out stare? People, kids like Bear this stuff? Was certainly his first love. Bonnie was extra special because that was his. It was an original character that he had created from scratch. And I- Oh no, it's like the Sonic OC artists of the 1930s. He's making Bonnie the Hedgehog. Mean scratch. William's hand-sewn costumes were rough with seams and stitches visibly showing, but it was the best that he could do. And you know what? It was just enough. Bonnie and Fred Bear would perform on stage to small but enthusiastic crowds. Finally, he was able to deliver fantasy and fun to all the kids delighting and inspiring them in the exact way that he had been delighted and inspired. Yeah, so those kids look delighted and inspired. If I was, if I looked delighted and inspired, that's what I'd look ago. like. And things could have ended there. That could have been the end to his story. It could have been perfect had it not been for one thing. Other people saw the success of his idea and they <gasps> wanted in. Enter no, Chica's Party they didn't. World, a rival no. restaurant starring performing animal characters. His idea- 
Wait a minute. Okay, I've been through this before. Just because someone makes something that is like something else doesn't mean it is a direct copy or a rip. Maybe they just had the same idea. It's a bunny. It's, uh, you, you got a bunny, they got a bear, and this but this is a duck. It's just a duck. There's, there's no intellectual property rights. There's no copyrights against using an animal in their pizzeria or their cafe or their restaurant to entertain kids because kids like animals. There's nothing, you can't copyright claim that. You know, I, I don't like this purple guy. Idea I think he's a bad guy. It better. William may have been the first, but obviously he wasn't the best. It hurt the prideful William Afton to admit it, but this restaurant was able to do the thing that he always wanted to do, make the animals actually come to life. All of the performers in this restaurant were robots, simple metal skeletons that were powered by battery packs, but all of them able to freely turn and talk Wait, they had that in the 1940s? No human required. It was like magic. Magic that came from the mind of a brilliant creator named Henry Emily. This Henry, in some small way, had been able to harness the power of life itself. Afton admired him. He was jealous. To be How old was William Purple Guy when the World War II ended? He was, he was talking about the 1930s, right? So, I mean, realistically, he might have been old enough to be shipped off to World War II when that happens. Maybe maybe that would have been the better ending. Sure, but he also looked upon this man with awe. Off to one side of Chica's party world was a small cabaret stage featuring an elephant magician. On the other, a hippo known to ramble on and on. That one was more of a joke for the parents. But it was the main stage that was for the kids. A rocking band of characters featuring a yellow chicken thing with a... <laughs> Come on, look at it! Look at it! I know that this is not- Withered Chica was the original stage performer, however, undamaged render doesn't exist. Okay, so it's not damaged. Alright, I understand. But the, will you show me that? And you're like, the kids love them. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I, I can see why. Southern drawl named Chica, backed by a band Don't of say other country-themed characters, including a pig with a banjo, an upbeat frog from the local swimming hole, and a brown bear with a heavy southern accent. Wait. A bear? But bears were his animals. Why not oh, a cow? Oh no. Or a horse? Something to fit the country theme a bit better. Why did it have to be a bear? And adding insult to injury, they had the nerve to call there are this bears in the country? Ned Bear. A oh, okay. Never mind. I take it back. Okay. He's clearly ripped the idea. But what is worse? Ripping the idea and doing it worse or ripping the idea and doing it better? He's ripped the idea. He's a yonk and twist here. Is essentially what it's come down to. I think that if he changed the name, then that would have been fine. It wouldn't have been Freddy Fazbear. It would have been something totally different. It's okay to use a bet. We do a little bit of yoink and twisting. We do this on YouTube all of the time. People take ideas from each other. We take them and we modify them. And we make them better. We try to uh, make the best version of a video that we possibly can. And it's okay if you take ideas from something else. Just don't call it Nedbear. We, if we didn't call it Nedbear, none of the Five Nights at Freddy stuff would have happened. Direct copy of his own Fredbear. Whoops, that's gonna leave a mark. No, that was not okay. Afton's jealous admiration turned to hardened bitterness. A bitterness that would only grow over the next couple of years as families continued to choose Chica's party world over Fredbear's. William just couldn't compete with the appeal of the robots. Eventually, his restaurant would go bankrupt, only to get bailed out by, of course, Henry Emily. Another insult. Another humiliation that William wouldn't soon forget. Oh no, this is like the Breaking Bad episode where the friends of the family are like, we'll pay for your cancer treatment, and, and Walt's like, no! I need to go cook meth instead. 1979. Despite being bitter, Afton couldn't deny that what came next was a period of massive success and expansion. With the two franchises now merged into one, it was the best of both worlds. Afton's ideas with Henry's robotic expertise. The two men decided to launch under a new name, Fred Bear's Family Diner, a pizza chain that would eventually come to feature a mix of humans in performing suits as well as on-stage animatronics. They decided to stick with Fred Bear as the headliner considering the Yellow Bear was easily identifiable as a brand and because he was the original original performing animal mascot after the Oh, he bought up the restaurant so that he'd get all those characters because he was like, ooh, I like those characters, let me have them. But that's just capitalism, baby. Henry Emily's doing ultimate capitalism right now. That's, uh, that, you gotta be. This new restaurant would. If you live in America, you're probably like, yeah, this is also awesome. Also, a mix of characters as the two franchises merged into one, with Pig Patch and Happy Frog performing right alongside Fred Bear and Bonnie. And as part of this one big. Fred I didn't know Bear there was family, a pig and a frog. They even got themselves official merch that were released, ranging from masks to magnets. The crappy Mr. Hippo fridge magnet? <laughs> Sorry, that said, not all the characters were winners. The reception to some characters was just mediocre. So they faded away into the dumpster, storage units, and retro budget tech stores of lost nostalgia waiting for their- No, hippos are sick. Hippos are such an underrated animal. They're actually some of those dangerous animals on the planet. Hippos are so- Hippos need more love, frankly. But also, they're very scary. They need love and they need respect. Step back into the limelight if and when a headliner went out of commission. Others, though, would fare much better. Like a new pirate fox as well as a blue 
guitar playing variant of the yellow Bonnie Bunny. Ultimately, now that sucks. To be honest, the Fox one, Fox one is sick. The new Bonnie, don't Friends like that. So big, it would spawn its own cartoon show, Fred Bear and Friends. Business was booming. In the end, Fred Bear and Bonnie's popularity would be so strong that they would be able to support the Fred Bear's Family Diner franchise all on their own, while also spinning off a new sister location dedicated to their friends. In 1983, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza launched, giving a dedicated home to all this new supporting cast of characters. Chica the Chicken, Bonnie the Blue Bunny, Foxy the Pirate, and of course the headliner, a brown Freddy Fazbear. Bear. Oh, so that's that's the one from the first game then, because that has all the original characters from Business the first game. This was good, and Afton was happy, mostly. It did bother him that the one original character that he created, the one that he himself played, Golden Bonnie, got passed over for inclusion in that cartoon show. The only character in the roster of Rick. Wouldn't he still own the intellectual rights to it though? I mean, I understand that his restaurant was bought out by Henry Emily, but that I, does he also sign away the rights to all of his characters so that he couldn't have any kind of control whatsoever? What kind of control does Purple Guy even have now over these businesses? What is he even doing that? Regulars to get ignored for the show, but other than that, things were going smoothly. He had himself a wife, two sons, a daughter. He had a thriving business. And best of all, he was able to learn the craft of robotics from the man that he both loved and hated, Henry. Together, they were constantly pushing the limits of what these characters could do. Because it was quick and easy, new characters introduced into the roster would be given a simple hand-sewn suit with five fingers that any performer could wear. Eventually, Henry would design one of his signature animatronics for that character, utilizing a divided mouth with either a hinged or sliding jaw design. This was the first generation of animatronics. But why are there two sets of teeth in all of them? Is that just a horror element? Or did they actually design that for a reason? <laughs> Is there a reason that an animatronic would need a second set of teeth behind why the first? Afton had big ideas. They don't eat things. What if the animatronics weren't just locked to the stage, but could freely roam the restaurant and interact with the kids? What if his mascot suits could be- Yeah, Gem 1, this is the canto of Five Nights at Freddy's. Come animatronics. What if you could use more than just rigid metallic skeletons? Might not experiment with tubes and wires that would give the animatronics fluidity and endoskeleton jesus christ i swear an entire generation of kids learned that word there is no way that anyone knows what an endoskeleton is if it's not for five nights at freddy's now everyone types that word out it's the biggest word that five-year-olds know nowadays ability while still providing structure the possibilities for this technology were endless afton fell in love with robotics he had started with a dream of bringing one simple singing bear yeah i didn't know what i meant either <laughs> he had stumbled across the tools that gave him the ability to control life itself and thanks to henry he was proud Okay. Speed running his way to an engineering degree. And while William wouldn't admit it out loud, one other thing that kept pushing him forward was the desire to beat his former rival. To prove himself smarter and more capable. To surpass the man who everyone else considered to be a visionary genius. But and he's probably fine with that as well, because he technically owns the company since he bought it out. So he's like, yeah, no, fall, that's okay. And tragedy was... He's, Purple Guy is now working extra hard to make Henry more money. Mm. Okay, so that brings us to the end of part one of the story. That said, at the end of each of these chunks, I want to break down some of the logical All right, break it I down. Since break it down, Matt. And admittedly, there are some large leaps in here. Let's just start off with Fred Bear's singing show, shall we? We know, based on the retro poster that was hidden in Security Breach, that at least at one point, Fred Bear was an actual bear. And like I called out in that narrative segment, dancing bear shows were a real form of entertainment. The only problem is that Time oh, did he make it up? Wise, none of our main characters would be the people in charge of that business in the 30s and a series of pizza restaurants in the 80s without him just being extremely old. Best case scenario, if Afton's running the singing show when he's 18, that still puts him at nearly 70 when the first pizzeria opens. I think it's fine to make things up. I mean, that's what literally it is, right? It, it's a theory. You fill in the gaps of the evidence that you have with things that you think could make sense that's the entire point of a theory. That, that's what theory is, right? And his murder spree. Oh, but then again, I guess gravity is a theory. So, hmm. Begins. That just doesn't make a lot of logical sense because he doesn't become immortal until his first death in Springtrap. That's why I suspect that Fred Bear's singing show was either a family business that Afton then carried on to a new generation or something that he saw as a kid and just wanted to recreate when he grew up. The Fred Bear singing show thing also starts laying the groundwork for some of the core elements of the story. That Freddy's was a place of fantasy and fun and that Afton Afton, despite eventually falling to become the heartless serial killer and mad scientist that we know him as, began as someone with good intentions and a love of entertaining kids. He wanted to bring things to life from the very beginning, a theme that recurs a lot for him throughout the rest of the franchise. Next up, let's talk about those mascot costumes. One thing that I keep going back to is the design of Glitch Trap. It's a handcrafted suit. You can see 
This is glitch trap. Okay. I mean, you can't die in this one at least. This one's safe. Everything. It even has five fingers for the performer's hands. It is very much God, not he's so creepy. a spring trap suit. This is something much more rudimentary. This is a pretty good design for what I imagine a 1950s version of a costume would look like, though. They're gonna look deranged. This is what I imagine them to look like. Right here, look at all this. This is so deranged. That's why I imagine- See, that's why I don't think it's that bad of a, <laughs> of a costume. It came at a time before animatronics were a part of the story. That's why I suspect that it was actually the first, predating literally everything. It's also a suit that is very personal to Afton. He put his digital consciousness in that form. It's his personal avatar. It's the way that he sees himself. He put his digital consciousness in that form. I can't wait till we get to that There's part. There's also a whole separate discussion to be had here about the habits and rituals of serial killers. So the fact that he's choosing to lure kids and kill them in this particular suit actually says a lot about his emotional attachment to it. So while Fred Bear seems to have started as someone else's creation, Golden Bonnie was uniquely Williams, giving him a personal connection. And that's not all. In this whole franchise, only one set of characters have themselves five fingers, the nightmares. Even Golden Freddy, Fred Bear was a five-fingered wearable suit at one point in the story, as we see in this shot from the graphic novel. Before, he he, like everyone else, was turned into an animatronic. This seems to imply that- I always think it's crazy that you put an endoskeleton inside of a suit that people are also supposed to get into. Bearing in mind, that just sounds a little bit dangerous from a should we do this standpoint, it, which obviously comes to fruition in the series. But how are you supposed to walk around with that? I know it's probably like a lightweight metal, but that just sounds really heavy. Considering suits in general, they're heavy. And you add a metal component of everything a robot is gonna need to be able to function, that just sounds heavy. They remove it, oh, they remove it, that's right. No, they remove it, that's right. <laughs> All of the you main characters out. had similar wearable that makes mascot sense. outfits at least at one point in time. And that whoever is having the FNAF 4 nightmares, if they even are nightmares, something that we'll touch on in part two, saw those mascot suits specifically. Lastly, we have to talk about the elephant in the room. The literal elephant, Orville, elephant, as well as the rest of the mediocre melodies. Do we have to talk about that one? Now, I've suspected that the mediocre melodies played a much more important role in the story than just being a bunch more animatronics to fill out- Damn, imagine being called the mediocre Melanies. It's like calling, be calling the standard Steves. The medium mollies. The roster. <laughs> Especially Ned Bear, which is just so suspiciously close to Fred Bear. And yet, there are two key details that we're gonna have to justify with any mediocre melodies mention. One, they're very rudimentary with external battery packs, implying that they come very early in the timeline. And two, we know that, at minimum, Mr. Hippo does eventually become an official member of the Extended Freddyverse. But if- Let's go! The Extended Freddyverse B! <laughs> Seriously, the Hippo one is so good. The Hippo is more dangerous than any of these other animals. It is more likely to murder you than- Anything else that you've seen so far today? are supposed to be cheap, generic rip-offs. Why would you be trying to rip off yourself? You wouldn't. You would be stealing someone else's ideas. So if Afton created Fredbear, there would have to be some rival franchise. The only other person who would likely be ripping him off? Henry. We've talked extensively about how the mediocre melodies are clearly Henry's design aesthetic. So it just has to be him. I don't think Henry's doing this maliciously. He doesn't strike me as the type. He was likely building the robots at the orders of someone else that was running a rival restaurant franchise. But that's the big CEO executives to start down a path of jealous rivalry, but also begrudging admiration. As the Freddy Files Ultimate Edition says, it's important to revisit the beginning of Henry and William's relationship. So here you go. I think this is where it begins. Also, this is future Matt Pat here coming back to add this one in. Seems like the future recently Matt released character encyclopedia has backed up all of this speculation. I've had this timeline written for about a month now, but I've also been holding off a bit to see what wrenches this character encyclopedia might throw into it. And on this particular I can't imagine the stress that comes with sitting down to write the Five Nights at Freddy's ultimate timeline, knowing that no matter what you write, there's gonna be a legion of 14 to 16 year olds that grew up with Five Nights at Freddy's, throwing pitchforks and torches at you no matter what you say. Your point, I gotta say, it seems like we might actually have nailed it. They actively call out the suspicious similarities to the main Fredbear crew. Quote from one of the pages, Ned Bear looks like an imitation, altered just enough to avoid copyright issues. I don't know about you, but that seems to imply that we were right I don't know. <laughs> Knowing all of this at one point. Does that really make you a bad person? <laughs> so, I understand, like, it's definitely copying a little bit, but there's companies that do that every day and we're fine with it. Like, cola. There's seven different 
versions of cola in every single shop that you go to, and no one gets mad about the franchises that. franchises had to have merged. That's really the only way that you get Mr. Hippo from the rival franchises part of the Fazbear crew. This also mirrors a lot of what happened in the real-life history of Chuck E. Cheese, with two rival restaurants, each with their own casts of characters, merging to become one unified brand. Again, we've gone into that in detail with other videos, just wanted to remind you all of that here. Are these real Chuck E. Cheese guys? Okay, I'm gonna be honest. I think Chuck E. Cheese is more demented than Five Nights at Freddy's characters. Reality is more insane than the fiction. They look scarier. But why would I call out the rival restaurant as being named Chica's Party World? Few things, actually. First, we know for a fact that a location named Chica's Party World exists. It is mentioned in the source code teasing sister location. So it is out there somewhere and doesn't fit cleanly anywhere. Second, in the story of the puppet carver, Chica is very explicitly what looped in with the book versions of Pig Patch and Ned Bear, implying that she started as a mediocre melody. Thirdly, her design just fits better with a the theme of down home country animals with southern accents playing the banjo and eating with bibs. And with her being the headliner of the show with her name on Seems the restaurant, a racist. it would make sense then that when the restaurants merged, she was the one that was added to the main cast of characters while all the other mediocres fade. Whatever, all of these characters suck. We all know that Sub Noodle is the greatest character of all time and beats every single one of these easy. Sub Noodle clear diffs every Five Nights at Freddy's character, and it's not even a close it issue. It's, it's not even Freddy's a problem. She loses after William's killing spree. She's the one to branch back off into her old franchise and is therefore missing in sister location, a detail that's bothered me for years at this point. It might also explain why William decided to stuff his first dead kid into Chica. That one was Henry's creation, not his. Is all of this a big leap? Yeah. Is it connecting a lot of dots that are- <laughs> He's like shoving the kid inside of the animatronic like, yeah, Henry, take that. <laughs> that that'll sure show him. Oh, he's gonna be so mad when he finds out. He's gonna come to work and he's gonna look at Chica and be like, oh, I love Chica. He's gonna, he's gonna be like, oh no, there's a dead kid in Chica. Man, that sucks. Oh, I'm so upset now. What the They're fuck? very spread out across the franchise that I've been holding on. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna prank him so Absolutely. good. Absolutely. But I think it makes sense. It also serves as a clean answer to a lot of the random threads that Scott's been leaving dangling for years. So with all of that in mind, my friends, we can close Close the book on the foundation of Freddy's. And don't worry, next week I'll be back to give you arguably one of the most confusing parts of this entire timeline situation. Part two. Well, why don't we just go back onto that? This is Five Nights at Freddy's. The ri wait, wait. Five Nights at Freddy's. The rise of Afton. Ultimate timeline. Let's go. And officially, page seven of the FNAF timeline script. Last time we covered the origins of Freddy's. We talked about William Afton's childhood dream project of making a singing bear come to life, and the infuriating moment that his dream is copied by a rival restaurant franchise looking to steal away his success. The merger of the two franchises results in William meeting Henry, a brilliant designer with a knack for robotics. Working together, they make Fred Bears flourish, spawning popular Saturday morning cartoon shows, toy lines, and spin off restaurants under the Fazbear name. When last we left him, Afton was thriving, the world of robotics opening his eyes to new and exciting ways of bringing characters to life. Bringing this William Afton seems to be doing pretty well for himself. I don't see how things could possibly take a turn for the things worst. Things to life. Yeah, that was his core driving force, his passion. And it was this very passion that would mutate, twist, and morph from here on out in the story. Because with life, there is inevitably death, something that Afton would become intimately familiar with. But before- there doesn't have to be when it comes to fun, friendly, family animatronics. I think that there can just be life, and you don't have to include the death part. That's or okay. Afton acquaints himself with death. I want you to take some time to acquaint yourself with our newest channel. Guys, it's Style Theory! The, the video, the, the channel that won't let me show any of their content, so I'm a little bit scared about showing this, this advertisement for Style Theory. Business was booming with two whole restaurant franchises running. Fred Bear's Family Diner and the newly opened Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Together, William and Henry had been able to take the hybrid suit idea and make it into a reality. They called their new invention the Springlock Suit, and fittingly enough, it was symbolic of the partnership between these two men, a human suit as designed by William that could become a freestanding Henry-style robot. But because it was still new tech with kinks to work out, the rollout was limited, restricted only to the Fred Bear's Family Diner location. All of this meant that William was- Well, they only have two ever. places anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. He designed a nanny cam system where cameras and speakers were hidden throughout the neighborhood, as well as in his youngest son's favorite toy, Psychic Friend Fredbear. I mean, plushy Fredbear. But since cameras just weren't enough to raise a kid, he also left childcare duties to his eldest son, Michael. Dude, this kid is always crying. Like, 
Come on, have a lollipop or something, cheer up a bit. There was just one problem with that. Michael was far from the best babysitter. He tormented his younger brother by jump scaring him with a foxy mask and constantly left him behind. William watched all of it from his cameras. Kids would be kids. Definitely Tomorrow a criminal. was another day after all. Except Michael's torment didn't stop. Bitter, angry thoughts would run through Michael's mind. Why did he have to be the one to take care of this whining crybaby all the time? It just Facts. wasn't fair. Damn, Michael kind of base. It was time that he got even with his brother by playing the ultimate Yeah, that's prank, right. A prank that just so happened to be on this crying child's birthday. He and his fr Yeah, punish the kid for crying. That's right. He deserves he it. To take his scared little brother and make him do the one thing that he was terrified of doing. Getting close to the animatronics. That would be embarrassing for the kid that was such an embarrassment to Oh, him. he'll probably his pee himself. Swore, screamed, kicked, and fought. But just as they were putting the you know what's crazy about this is th this is exactly the kind of thing that kids would do in real life because the kids are so deranged. Also, wh where I don't know if anyone has asked this before, uh, Matt Pat of Game Theory, but where are the parents in this situation? Where is William Atherton? Is he working on a spring lock suit? Where's the mother in this situation? Who is taking care of these kids? Why is no one watching them next to the massive robots that could eat you whole in one bite? Oh my god, it's the bite of either 87 or 83. We will find out soon. And that small squirming boy up to Fredbear's lips, the mouth snapped shut. The sensitive spring locks inside the body and immediately lobotomizes a crying child. They immediately clamped down. The wriggling stopped. The boy went limp. But it was just a prank. It was meant to be funny. The boy was taken to the hospital. No, it was funny. He's gonna, dude, we're really gonna look back on this in like 20 years. We're gonna laugh about it. You don't need your entire brain. Do you know how big the brain is? Do you know how many brain cells there are? You don't need all of them. It's like kidneys. You don't need all of them. immediately given an IV. Flowers and pills filled the nightstand next to his hospital bed. But the damage was too severe. He couldn't recover. As the younger brother's oh. consciousness uh -oh. began to fade, he could hear Michael's last words. A small and flimsy apology. But his father, Williams, through okay, the voice that's... of the Fredbear plush, were a firm and committed promise to a dying son. You're broken. I will put you back together. This- That's a bit of a nasty thing for a dad to say to a dying child. I, I wouldn't go for the words, you're broken. That seems a bit unhelpful. Not the end. No matter what, William's son would live again. It would just take time. Time that, right now, he just didn't have. His young son's heart flatlined as the boy faded into- Wait, he didn't have? Of the aftermath. Oh, because he was the dying. Aftermath of the tragedy. Dude, what the fuck? Wait, so the brother straight up kills the brother? Why? Well, I didn't know he killed him. I thought he just like lobotomized him or something like that. Changes started happening around the restaurants. Kids were now required to wear security wristbands to prevent anyone from getting outside without parental permission. Any kid who approached the exit without permission would have to answer to the security puppet. A marionette on strings that could fly around on rails across the restaurant to stop kids in their tracks. It was- Hold on, let's just absorb that for a second. Instead of the entire place being shut down or the animatronics just not being used anymore because apparently animatronics can't be trusted to not murder kids, what we'll do is we'll put wristbands on them and if they try to walk out of the building, we'll have a, f a marionette pop out on strings and scare them instead of- I don't know, having adults there. William's Maybe. Idea. Inspired by Michael constantly leaving the restaurant without his brother in the wake of Fred Bear's- Also, the lobotomy happened inside of the restaurant. So what's the marionette gonna do when Fred Bear decides to have another bite? Ring lock failure, all the hybrid suits were getting retired, locked away at the nearby Freddy Fazbear location. It was yet another tough pill to swallow after all the hard work that he and Henry had put into them. William would eventually bury the boys' small- <laughs> It's a tough pill to swallow. Like, I understand that you're putting effort into it, but I think if something murdered your kid, you'd be totally down with getting rid of it. Listen, if a dog mauls your baby, then you're like, that sucks. My baby's dead now. Can't have the dog anymore. I don't think you'd be, you know, that, that, you're not gonna sit there and be like, oh man, but can I, re can I keep, ah, oh, can I keep the suit though? Ooh. Body in a remote location out in the woods, right alongside his drive into and out of work every day. The death of this little boy sent the family spiraling. His wife, crippled with grief, was so distressed that all she could do was sit and watch TV. But his son Michael is that wife? Was far worse. Complaining of seeing hallucinations of a golden bear standing outside of his window. The boy was so racked with guilt that he was convinced that he was being haunted by the ghost of his brother stuck inside the suit that took his life. The suit's three-toed feet digging into the wet earth. The words, it's me, ringing through Michael's ears. Some nights, Michael would even go so far as to break out of his room Oof. to check the gravesite and ensure that his brother was still there. As for William and- Wait, he dug up the grave? That would be really nice. Noticeable, wouldn't it? What does he just check that there's a decomposing corpse there? Like, oh, yeah, he's just you know, he's decomposed a little bit more. Oh, well, there goes the eyeballs. Self, he disappeared into his work and his drinks. Junior's, the local bar, wasn't far from. 
How about therapy? No, 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 this was the 80s. If you're a fella in the 80s, even if you're a young boy in the 80s, no therapy allowed because they thought it was like gay or something, Sounds I don't know. Sight. He found himself going there more and more frequently, spending longer and longer amounts of time there. The bar gave him a place to think, to remember, to reflect and stew on how Henry had only therapy I need is a beer, brother. Restaurant. How they'd cut his character out of the cartoon when everyone else was there. How Henry had humiliated him by buying him out of bankruptcy. And now, now there was his son. Henry had taken his son from him. The robotic part was the part that failed after all. William ordered. You know, this line of thought is exactly the kind of line of thought you'd have from someone who just had their child killed by something that he helped create and also then drank 17 gallons of beer. One more drink, but this is very realistic. Bar turned him out and told him to go home. But William didn't go home. Drunk and angry, William raced back to the restaurant to give Henry a piece of his mind, only to find someone else waiting. Henry's daughter, Charlie, locked outside of the building. Are you saying gay is an insult? No, I'm saying that in the 80s, they would have used it as an insult and they would have said that, oh, you go to therapy? Bro, that's kind of gay. Because that's exactly the kind of thing that they would say back then. Of course, it's ridiculous now and I don't actually believe that. The bullies <laughs> laughing at her through the window. Fine, some other problem to fix. But then Afton got an idea, a beautifully awful idea. This, this he turns into the Grinch. To get back at the man that had humiliated him all those years ago. Henry had killed his business, and now Henry's robotic suit had killed his son. It was time for William to do some killing of his own. Let uh -oh. Henry feel what it's like to have something you love get ripped away. Well, parties continue. Okay, I actually like the way that he's trying to explain the thought process here because this feels re very realistic. I could actually see this happening. People have killed people for much, much, much less. And going down that kind of rabbit hole, I feel like it's been explained really well. Inside the walls of the pizzeria, William attacked Charlie. Whether or not it's out. accurate, I don't know. He felt good. He felt free. The years of resentment and bitterness trapped in his heart finally released in a moment of pure unapologetic evil. He would make Henry hurt like he hurts. <laughs> And in that moment, William became a killer. He dropped Charlie's lifeless body and drove home, forced to confront his family problems later that night, appalled, but also a little excited by what he had just done. Charlie's death would remain on the books as a random act of violence. And though Henry had suspicions about William, there was no physical evidence, nothing that could link him back to the crime. In the weeks that followed, Fred Bear's family diner would close for good. Two high-profile deaths around the restaurant with two grieving owners in such a short period of time was just too much bad press to handle. Besides, Freddy Fazbear's was still open and it that's crazy because he probably would have gotten away with it in the 80s as well because they were so absolutely awful at solving any kind of crime back in the 80s if you didn't have hard evidence against you as a murderer you could get away with anything you could just clock someone go out into the middle of the desert dig a hole and then when the police come over they're like have you seen this person you're like hmm I'm sorry officer I ain't seen them why is something wrong they're like yes it's, they've been murdered recently like, oh well that sounds like quite the predicament officer hope you can find them I don't want no violence in my area. Then he closed the door, boom. You're, you're, you're fine, you're fine. You can just get away with it. You just get away restaurant with it. Anyway. All the equipment from the diner, including the old yellow suits and security puppet, would get retired to that location. And there they would sit for two uneventful years. The rest of 1983 and 1984 were spent quietly grieving. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza and the new cast of characters were a hit. Okay, Tragic so those are the bite in, of bites of 83. quickly faded. Afton kept a low profile and buried himself in work and research, quickly reaching Henry's level of engineering and even surpassing him. And while Henry slowed down to grieve, Afton kept going, even starting his own company, Afton Robotics, for all those pet projects that were a little bit too experimental for the regular operations of the pizzeria. The first of these experimental projects was a secret workshop under his house, a veritable bunker, which allowed him to work while still monitoring his kids via hidden security camp. How do you have the money for this? Did they, they must have so well, they didn't sell the restaurants, they just shut down, because they still have access to it all. Dude, these people are loaded. One, nine, eight, Three, a passcode that served as a constant reminder of why the cameras were so important, why he was down there in the first place. This was all to fulfill the promise that he had made to his son, right? I will put you back together. This was for him, all for him right? But cameras weren't enough. He needed to solve the runaway Michael problem. He had to keep him in the house. He couldn't have another one of his kids wind up dead inside of an animatronic suit. So why not run a little experiment on Michael? You see, all this work with Henry had gotten Afton to start learning more about life, robots, the human mind, and what a fallible machine we as humans were. Our reality is so easy to manipulate with a few sensory deceptions. Deceptions like sound. With just a few sounds, he had discovered that he could alter a person's vision. He could transform blanks, smooth plastic robots into lumbering twisted nightmares. Nightmares far scarier than he could create with actual
Okay, I was under the impression that Five Nights at Freddy's 4 was a dream sequence. <laughs> so I I'm excited to see how this goes. Materials. They would appear organic, rotting, putrid, terrifying. These would be his means of keeping- Looks like they've been touched by Nurgle. He belonged. Was it extreme? Thank you, Richie. But then again, this was the boy. Yeah, that's true. He should be arrested for tax evasion. Is he paying taxes on all this? I bet he didn't pay taxes on- That's the worst thing that William Afton has done, is he didn't pay his taxes, he would did he? He killed his son. He would make him sorry. And so Michael would grow up not only dealing with the memories of his own guilt, the hospital room, the pills, the flowers, Hours, the death of his brother, but also facing literal nightmares, illusions created by sound. Mike oh man, that's evil. Michael would never forget these either. Years later, as a security guard, he would still draw pictures of them inside of his logbook. But all of these extra projects meant that his home life suffered even more. He was an absent father and a non-existent husband, leaving his wife cold and alone. Is that the wife? Oh my goodness. That looks like an absolute shell of a human. Oh, that's so sad. I guess what happens when, that's what happens when your kid dies, right? Why do you hide inside your walls? Is that the wife? When there is music in my halls. No, you're right. I'll come. I'll come right out. It's time for a little jig. Time for a little dance. Hey, let's go. Having a good time. So so much fun. All I see is an empty room. No more joy. An empty tomb. Nurse? And despite her repeated Nurse? demands that he leave his office and engage with the family, he refused time and time again, leaving her no choice but to leave. You burned down my house? You call that a house? It was like a morgue in there. You need to see your son! The baby isn't mine. Well, how's this? I'm keeping the diamond Is that purple ring. guy? All, there was Wait, is this a is that supposed to be purple guy? What an interesting turn of events. He's Dracula. He can suck blood. One lingering feeling. William wasn't done. He had gotten a taste. That would be a fantastic twist on the whole event. Oh yeah, by the way, Purple Guy is, he's, that's Dracula. Like he, he's, he's, he's like a vampire and stuff. He goes out, he's turned turn to a bat. It's really cool. ...of what it felt like to be unleashed. What it felt like to be free. Charlie's murder... Yes, it's a metaphor. Something in him, and it's not actually him. More. June 26th, 1985. Putting on the golden bonnie suit, he lured children one by one to the back room of the pizzeria when no one was looking. At first, he was cautious. He would lure them with promises of cake and cookies. He told them that their dog had died. He would ask for help with homework. Susie was the first. You never truly forget your first. I was the first. That is a crazy sentence to put at the end. You never, you never forget your first. I have only heard this in very different contexts. But where to hide the bodies? He couldn't sneak out. Someone would see him. He had to hide them in a place where they'd never be found and where they'd never. D did no one see the kids being taken away? Did no one think like, oh, hey, where's my kid? <laughs> I, I came here with a kid and now there's no kid. So it's, it must've gone somewhere. It's not like dropping a pen, right? You don't just, you don't just like drop a pen. And you're like, oh man, I can't find the pen. Oh, I'll just get another one. That's your, that's your child's. So so I would imagine there would be more of a fuss kicked up about a child dying considering it happened several times before in the same area as this guy. A little bit more suspicion maybe. Never leave the building. They had to be stuffed. Stuffed inside of the suits. No one maintained those things anyway except for him. And so Susie would go into Chica. Fritz, Jeremy, and Gabriel would come next. But it was easy. It was what about the police? Surely if a child had disappeared inside of a building, the police would visit said building and then they would, I don't know, look around at everything. I assume if you get next to the Chica doll, there would be a rotting decomposing sm smell that would emanate from said doll. I know that the police are very incompetent back then and they weren't very good at solving crimes, but at the very least, if you walk into a room with a decomposing kid in it, you might notice it slightly. It's too easy. And with each little life he snuffed out, his lies got bigger. Their house was burning. They're just being kidnapped. Until the last one where all pretense was off. He let himself get violent. Too violent. I'll just wait for him after school throw a bag over his head, hit him with a shovel, and drag him into the back of my car. The body of Cassidy was far more bloody and broken. It is way too easy to kill kids in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> what? any of the others. He'd let himself go too far. That one? That one he shouldn't have killed. With no more active animatronics left, he shoved the body into the one suit that remained backstage. The long-forgotten yellow Fredbear. Now broken and discolored with age. Broken. Like Cassidy was broken. Like his son was broken. Newspapers reported on this disappearance, naming the whole thing the missing children's incident. Police would even charge William with the crimes after finding security footage of the golden mascot suit luring kids to the back. But they- Okay, okay, so they charged him, he killed kids, GG's. 
it's over. Like, you, you're not getting out of that one. It's, it's multiple kids killed, even if the police release you for whatever reason, which they probably won't, because if they charge you with a crime, they are going to check the building, they're going to look around and find the decomposing kid bodies. It's over. Even if you get out, you're gonna get lynched in the streets. They couldn't convict him. They had no bodies, and his face had been hidden behind the mascot suit the entire time. What they- yeah, The one he shouldn't have killed, MatPat says. The other one, the first four, that's fine. Everyone does a little kid murder as a treat for Christmas, if you've really worked hard and you deserve it. But the last one, that was a bit too much. He indulged too much. A bit greedy, we'll say. Dad was circumstantial at best, and so he walked away a free man. But dude, they suck so much. Henry knew the truth. In these murders, he saw his daughter. They Charlie weren't found over again. So he threw Afton out of the company and shuttered the doors to the old. Listen, I've heard of dead kid ghosts inhabiting animatronics, but the police not finding the bodies is the most suspense sus suspense I've had to disbelief. That's the most ridiculous thing in this entire series. Henry would keep the franchise quiet for two years. This would not happen again. This could not happen again. How could he protect the kids? Finally, he killed Pablo. Solution. He would implement an even more extreme security system in the form of new animatronics, toy animatronics, inspired by the toys that they had been selling years ago. But these guys, these were special. I'm not sure that's the solution. I don't think more animatronics is the solution to this problem. I think maybe we deal with this, the problem, which is the murderer, which surely Henry knows the, who's killing all the people by now. He knows 100% who it is. I think there is a solution here, and we're not quite gaining access to it. They were a new breed of robot with facial recognition abilities. But most importantly, they're all tied into some kind of criminal database so they can detect a predator a mile away. All the original animatronics, now withered with age, were moved to the new location. With a plan in place, it was time to try once more. The year was 1987, and the new and improved Freddy Fazbear's Pizza was making headlines in local newspapers. Headl Come on, this is like a YouTuber when they tried to make a channel again after being outed as a sexual predator. Don't, don't. Come on. What are you doing, man? This is like EDP 445 coming back and be like, hey guys, I'm gonna open up another YouTube channel. <laughs> Lines that just so happened to catch the attention of William Afton. Freddy's was back and without him? That was his idea, his character. Henry was yet again trying to cut him out of the picture. No, as long as these restaurants stayed open, I wonder why. he would always come back. Then he noticed the phone number to apply at the bottom of the article. $100 a week to apply call. Afton a hundred dollars a week in, what was that, 1987? Okay, a hundred dollars and 50 cents in 1987 would be worth about $266 a week in this day and age, even in Utah. That is nothing, man. That is abysmal. That's an insult. Oh we'll my go God, back. who's applying now, for this? As owner or co-founder, he would go back in the one place that they would least suspect him, a lowly day shift security guard. And there it was, buried in what? the back of park. Wait, 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 but there's one location. If Henry is opening one location, he should know who is working at this singular location. This isn't Mackie D's that has 7 billion locations where the CEO doesn't know who's working there. If there is one place, then you should know who is working at your one place. That will be like me hiring an editor, but I don't know who the editor is. How is that even possible? Arts and services a name change? No, 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 you still gonna know what they look like. Golden rabbits. With the yellow security badge still on his chest, he used his crank to pull open the spring locks. It was time for Bonnie to give an encore performance. Someone used one of the suits. We had a spare in the back, a yellow one. Someone used it. Wait, is this Five Nights at Freddy's 3? Right. Uh, no, I don't think it is yet. The building's on lockdown. No one is allowed in or out, you know, especially concerning any previous employees. When we get it all sorted out, Two. we okay. do to the day shift. A position just became available. 1987, five more kids. He didn't know what felt better. Getting back into the suit after two long years of waiting or knowing how devastating this would be to Henry the next morning. He, he killed five more kids? Come on. At what point do we just say that it's the parents' fault? They deserve it at this point. Come on, man. He didn't even try to hide his crime this time. Just meant more blood on Henry's hands. He'd failed to protect the kids again. The restaurant had only been open for a few weeks, but William was sure that this would get it to close. Good. If he couldn't have Freddy's, no one would. Whenever- Bro, if five kids die at a restaurant that opened a week ago- A new pizzeria- Come opened, on! be there. But as he sat in his bunker, something else started to linger in William's mind. He had seen something strange. The old- withered animatronics. They had been wandering around the building, spurred on by the puppet. It was almost like those old robots were trying to save the kids. Save them? They couldn't, obviously. Wait, save the kids? I think I know who Purple Guy really is.
The save the kids token. You guys remember that? The crypto scam? That's right. The purple guy is actually Phase K. The person that did the save the kids crypto scam. Phase K, why would you do this? Rice gum, why would you do this? Okay, I might be wrong. After an era. I promise it will. Oops, that's wrong video. But still, how were they moving? It was almost like they had been given life somehow. Did he have something to do with that? The following day, the news would report a security guard getting bitten by one of the animatronics during the day shift. Was that bite meant for, for him? William's curiosity was stronger now than his bloodlust. He had to learn more, but how? There was no way he'd ever be able to get inside another Freddy's pizzeria. Heck, there was practically no way of no, he's got like lock picking 100. He can just uh, sneak himself in. Freddy's would ever open again. He needed to create something new, something brand new. He needed to create his own pizzeria. Due to the massive success and even more so the unfortunate closing of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, it was clear that the stage was set, no pun intended, for another contender in children's entertainment. So if they allow this restaurant to open, every single person in the government that decides whether or not restaurants can open should get immediately executed. Circus Baby's Pizza World. This fuck's sake. This, this would be the place where he could continue his work. No longer just murdering, experimenting. He needed more kids and he needed them alive. And knowing that he couldn't show- Everyone is in on it. That is the only solution I can possibly come to this. Every single adult in Five Nights at Freddy's world just thinks that murdering kids is really awesome and funny and that we should do it all the time. Every single person has to be in on it. There's no way that this incompetent. To his face on the restaurant floor, he needed a way of remotely capturing his victims and preserving them for his work. The parents are in on it as well. Mind, he designed this is the kind of shit that happens in Utah. That's why I don't go. A new breed of animatronic. Their endoskeletons fluid and flexible. He equipped them with sound lures that could mimic voices. They could isolate children. They could incapacitate and contain them with zero direct input from him. It was brilliant. He was brilliant. Far beyond the simple bars. Dude, he, he made saw for five-year-olds. And wires of hand. Henry's designs, and the characters he chose for this were uniquely his. His new roster wasn't going to be tainted by Henry's disgusting barnyard bird. Instead, it was back facts. to his hey, facts. His creations. Freddy, Fuck Bonnie, ducks. Foxy, as well as two special ones. Don't like the them. first, Ballora, was an homage to the woman who left him. Now, she would never leave him again. The second, the titular baby, was designed with his baby in mind. Elizabeth, his youngest child. She would always be she still alive? little girl. The one that listened to him. The one that obeyed. Until the day that she didn't. Daddy, uh -oh. why won't you let me play with her? She's so pretty and shiny. Didn't you make her just for me? <laughs> The day before a circus baby's pizza world opened, she disobeyed. She didn't listen. Left alone with baby, she got too close. The animatronic ripped in half and swallowed her whole. A scared and confused child fading into eternal darkness. By the time Afton found her, it was too late. She was gone. He immediately canceled the launch of circus babies under the guise of a gas. But wait, as he sat there, he did, did, why? Everyone is so dumb. How can you make whole ass robots but still be so dumb? At the foot of the stage, he noticed that something was different. The eye color of the robot had changed. Baby had been built with blue eyes, but now they were emerald green, the same color as Elizabeth's. Was she in there? Could this all be connected to the free-moving animatronics that he had seen at Freddy's? He had to know more. His mourning turned to excitement. He had to return to where it all started. 1993. Pathetic. This place was pathetic. Henry had clearly tried to reopen one final time with those old original animatronics from so long ago, but William's damage to the brand had been permanent. These things stank of death. They hadn't been washed in decades. But even if they had, nothing could wash away the stink of murder that haunted these halls. One night, then another, then another. William repeatedly snuck into the old, broken restaurant to lure the living animatronics to him, one by one dismantling them, robbing them of their endoskeletons. The metal had to be the secret. It had to contain the remnants of life itself. But he had to know for sure. Leaping out of a room that was invisible to the animatronics programming, he dragged the oversized robotic skeletons back to his underground workshop, back to where certain this is the one that had the kids inside of them, right? The one that had the kids stuffed inside them. So in theory, they had this soul of the children inside of those ones. Circus Baby watched on with glowing, curious eyes. Did the corpses ever get removed? I mean, I would assume not, because if the corpses got removed, that would in then in, in turn act as evidence against him, so he would have been arrested. So the corpses still have to be in there. Eyes that somehow felt alive. Not knowing what else to do, William melted the robotic parts down. Five animatronic endoskeletons reduced down to one silver 
silvery puddle of goo. Could he transfer this living metal to his own creations? He had to try. He picked up a syringe and filled it with the molten metal and injected the goo into Funtime Freddy's twisted, wiry endoskeleton. And suddenly, the coils came to life. Like snakes writhing in a pile, what had once been cold, lifeless metal moved and jolted on its own. He'd done it! He had unlocked the secret to life itself! Except something was clearly wrong. The movements- This is like Full Metal Alchemist. You need to sacrifice in order to gain, right? You have to get rid of in order to get. So he's just he's sort of like, I found out how to make life! You just need to kill kids! Everybody believe me! How are you gonna report this to everyone else? What are you gonna say? Like, listen, guys, I know how to make robots come to life. Like, really come to life. And like, oh man, how do you do it? And they're like, mmm. Yeah, well, I can't really, mm, I can't really say. It's a little secret, actually, my special sauce were erratic. They were violent, angry. Baby didn't act this way. She had been calm, collected. This was clearly something else, something mindless and frantic. Perhaps by mixing the souls and then portioning them out, he had created incomplete beasts. He would need to keep testing to truly understand it. Oh he yeah, it's like the chimera all over rabbit. again. As he searched the old pizzeria one more time for any remaining scraps of metal, the ghosts attacked. His past victims come to collect their due, all led by Cassidy. The five- Bro, how does a ghost attack? It's just gonna float there. It's gonna float there and be all angry. So what's it gonna do, punch you? What are you gonna lose to a five-year-old ghost child? What are you gonna do to you? Just kick them. Oh wait, you can't kick them. They're ethereal. They can't do anything to you. Just ignore them. Bro, just close your eyes. Lined up and blocked the door, and Afton's mind reeled. The scientific implications of this were incredible. Ghosts, real ghosts that he could see all standing against him. But what could they do? What couldn't they do? He panicked yeah, exactly. as Cassidy approached. How do you stop something that's already- Okay, to play devil's advocate and to be fair, yes, I would also be scared if ghosts were just real and I also killed the kids and they were staring at me. That situation would be quite traumatic and very scary because you don't know what they're capable of. But at the same time, they're like five years old, it's Fine. Dead, maybe with the thing that resulted in their death in the first place. He would get into his suit like old times. He would regain his power over them just like the day that they died. That does make sense. Okay, ghost here. Uh-oh. Kind of scary. Aha. Uh -huh. A solution. I'll do the same thing I did when I killed them. Because I had power over them then. I'll get back in the suit. That's how I kill the kids. Boom. Bam. That's a sick idea. I love that idea. You're doing super good for yourself right now. Let's see how it goes. He was the genius. He was the one in the suit. He was That's the right. one in charge. Yep. The spring lock snapped into place. Maybe it was his frantic movements. Maybe it was the leaky abandoned restaurant. Maybe it was just fate coming to collect its due. He didn't know. The only thing he did know was that his brain was suddenly filled with searing white hot pain as hundreds of metallic pins and gears stabbed into his body from all sides. All he could do was collapse, blood slowly oozing out of the suit and pooling onto the floor around him. It couldn't end like this. It he would have gone away with it too, if it wasn't for those meddling kids. It wouldn't end like this. His work was unfinished. Unable to move, his only option was to survive, to live, to keep living. It took days lying in his own blood, but eventually someone found him. A security days? guard making a normal report. When he saw the animatronics torn apart in the middle of the party room floor, it caused him to file an immediate report of a break-in. An owner would have to come in and claim the damage. And who else would it be other than Henry? Hope jumped in Afton's heart. Henry would see him. They were partners after all. He would be the one to help save him, to get him out of this suit, to relieve him from Why? this tremendous pain. Henry Why would he do that? <laughs> Bro, you're dead anyway. This is 1980s America, buddy. You got health insurance? You are in for a big-ass bill. Your restaurant got shut down. You got no income, son. It's Henry over. entered the secret room. His eyes fell on Afton sitting there in the pool of red. And Henry, saying nothing, turned and walked away. This is just to inform all employees that due to budget restrictions, previously mentioned safe rooms are being sealed at most locations. Due to budget restrictions? Budget restrictions. What, do you not have enough money to power the door? Inside. I know, it's because he wants to kill off after and that's fine to be honest. Management also requests that this room not be mentioned to family, friends, or insurance representatives. And so there Afton would sit, hanging on for 30 years, trapped behind the walls with an iron will that refused to die. And did, what, did he not need lunch? Did, was someone f giving him PB&Js? End of this part. I say this part because it's not officially the end of the Afton era just yet, but this just felt like a really solid stopping point and the episode has gone on forever. Okay, so most of this is did he subsist off of really shitty Freddy Fazbear's pizza for 30 years? It's things that we already knew. Stuff that's been established and re-established time and time again by the games. That said, there are- Or, 
Alternatively, he dies, his human body ceases to require what it needs, and he is revitalized in the suit, which is, I guess, that makes sense? Are two things that I absolutely have to address. The first and biggest is the placement of sister location, or more specifically, Elizabeth's death. To me, evidence in game seems to suggest that he it was possessed meant to come the suit, before yeah. The crying that child's makes sense. death in 1983. The biggest clue to this is that the crying child saw something. Remember what you saw is the phrase that's repeated over and over again by psychic friend Fred Bear, aka William Afton speaking through a walkie-talkie in the Fred Bear plushie's stomach. But what did he see? Well, I think we can tell based on how the nightmare animatronics are visualized. They have mouths in their stomachs, just like baby ripping in half at the waist to swallow a kid. There's also the empty girl's room, one presumably left behind by a dead sister. And lastly, it explains- Wait, so they- Oh, he's trying to say that that happened before 1983 when he was and killed? Why he's scared and more specifically why Afton wants him scared. He needs his kids to stay away from the animatronics. He doesn't want them getting too close because the last time one of his kids got too close to a robot, his daughter died. That's then why he sets up the nightmares. To but then that wouldn't make her the one that listened, like he said before. Because if she was the one that listened and stayed away from the animatronics, then she wouldn't have been. That can't be Here, right. Both Mike and the crying child away from the animatronics from that point forward. That's why books like the character encyclopedia outright suggest that we play as the crying child in FNAF 4. That's why he has a nanny cam following the crying child everywhere, so he can keep tabs on his kids when they're out of his sight. He can't let another Elizabeth situation happen. The death of Elizabeth also gives William Afton extra motivation for killing. He's a grieving father. His daughter was taken away- No, the, the baby can't predate the first Five Nights at Freddy's because the technologically- the technology used for those animatronics is so much more advanced than the ones used for the other ones. From him, so Charlie should die as well. He's lashing out at the world after losing his kids. And again, we know that at least one of his children had to have died prior to Charlie's death, based on the mound of dirt that we see in Midnight Motorist. It also allows circus babies to open and close earlier in the timeline, which is how you wind up with Funtime Foxy appearing as Mangle in the FNAF 2 location. Basically, Elizabeth dying first has everything it needs to fit, except for the most important thing, the murder weapon. Why would Afton be building an animatronic with a giant claw in its stomach so early in the timeline? Yeah, why would he be making the kid killer animatronic before he has any reason to even try and kill At this kids? Point, he just has no motive. It just doesn't make sense prior to 1983. At this point in the story, he hasn't killed anyone. And we know for a fact that the missing children's incident is 19. Well, I mean, if you're gonna kill kids, you're gonna be a little bit deranged before the act anyway. You know how they say that serial killers always kill animals? Maybe he was using it to kill dogs. He was like, oh, I'm gonna use this animatronics to scoop up some dogs and I'm gonna mangle them all up and then, then serve it to my kids because I'm a weirdo. Five. So Elizabeth's death coming before any of those events just doesn't work. Hence why I placed it where I did in yeah, the doesn't, narrative yeah. timeline. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. death here is also a bit tricky. We know that he returned to the FNAF 1 location to break down the original animatronics in order to harvest their remnant. We know that he melts down five things to become one thing. Candy Cadet makes that very clear. So the five things are the five endoskeletons from the various animatronics. That would be totally fine if it weren't for one huge problem. On his fifth visit to the pizzeria, Afton gets spring-locked. So either the five becoming one starts in 1993, but then finishes 30 years later when he re-emerges from the wall to add the last endoskeleton to his pile, or... <laughs> could you imagine if it just chills there for 30 years? And he's like, ah, oh, I can finally get up again, Jesus Christ. All right, where's that last dead kid at? <laughs> he's had himself some reason the way to, to do this for to so long. Location after harvesting all the stuff that he can. It's not ideal, but it's the one angle that makes the most sense. And with that, this next chapter comes to a close, thereby leaving us with five more games to cover and another 40 plus years of Fazbear history to recap. Oh, there's only 40 years. If you put it that way, something tells me that this might balloon into four parts. Ugh, we'll see. Anyway, until then, my Faz heads, congratulations. You've made it through a massive upload. And then we have of the ultimate timeline burn them all video oh boy okay here's what i've learned so far the adults in this universe are completely useless completely insane the kids are just magnets to death they're so eager to get killed so they're like let's go let's go get killed Woo! let's go it's awesome they're absolute idiots but then again kids in real life are idiots as well and this purple guy's i don't know I, I don't like him i think he's a bit of a bad guy to be honest so here we go it's time to Page burn them all. Final FNAF timeline. This is getting ridiculous. Last Page time 20? William Afton's rise as a serial killer. How the loss of his young son in 1983 caused him to make one fateful promise that would ultimately serve as his driving force for decades. I will put you back together. 
No, I think his driving force for decades was, I love killing kids, it's awesome, and I have lots of fun doing it. That seems like more of his driving force because he wasn't really focused on the whole living metal, putting the souls into animatronics until after he had a really good time slaughtering kids left and right. Fueled by grief and obsession, Afton would lose himself in work and drinks. One night in a fit of rage, he lashes out against Henry's young daughter, Charlie, his first murder. This moment becomes the first domino to fall in a long sequence of events that ultimately destroys William's life and the lives of those around him. That one murder gives Afton a taste for blood, resulting in the deaths of ten more children across two different people. Pizzerias. Those children go on to possess animatronics, giving Afton his first exposure to Remnant and the potential solution for bringing his son back to life. The need to learn more about this miraculous <laughs> yeah, power- Yeah, that came after he killed 10 kids, by the way. So the whole killing 10 kids, that was just for funsies. ...to produce the Funtime animatronics, as well as their capture devices. Robots designed to bring kids to him for experimentation and collection of more Remnant. Except there was one thing that he didn't account for. Oh, 11 kids, that's right. curiosity. He made the robots too appealing, and it would cost him Elizabeth's life. Now with two children to put back together, Afton was more desperate- There's no free. way that he is shocked that the animatronics specifically created and curated to attract and murder kids, attracted and subsequently murdered his kid. He's not- you're not gonna surprise Pikachu face me on this one. Returning to defunct pizzerias to steal the possessed metal still living inside their walls. What he didn't account for though were the ghosts, forcing him to pay for the sins of his past. When last we left him, William- I feel like that's a pretty normal thing to not account for. <laughs> Generally, I wouldn't account for the ghosts in anything that I do in, in general life. And even if I did murders, which I've never done, I've never done murders before. I haven't. I probably wouldn't account for the ghosts <laughs> in that situation either. It was spring locked, leading to death behind a secret wall. Gone, but certainly not forgotten, as we're about to see in today's video. Today, we're finishing up chapter two of our story, wrapping up the Afton era. Over the next six pages, we switch our focus to the other main character of the franchise, Mike, a young boy dealing with the fallout of a stupid childhood decision with tragic consequences. A young man whose life is best described as collateral damage. Ca that's a, that's what he looks like now? Dude, he got a big the nose. Last radius of William's whirlwind of destruction. Now, before we begin, let me just rip off the band-aid now. We won't be finishing the timeline today. I, I know, I know, I'm sorry. But we will be finishing in this, in this video that I'm recording for my channel because I'm gonna upload it once all of the videos are out so we can do all the reaction in one video. Wanted to, but covering FNAF V VR, AR, and security breach wound up taking me an additional nine pages of script. And I've already made you wait long enough for this part, so I just had to make the executive call to break this one up into two. Don't worry, that part is already written, it is already recorded, it is just in the process of being edited. It is a hefty episode. So mark it on your calendar, that one's actually going to be going live on March 25th. It's also coming complete with a live talkback where we go back over everything from the past couple episodes, as well as having ourselves some very special guests. So- <gasps> Freddy Fazbear's gonna be on the stream! Oh, that one should be- Oh, let's go! Fair warning, let's go! Though, the conclusions we've reached that solve security breach, whew, they are controversial. I, I feel good about them. Like, I think that we've locked in on a lot of the answers here, but, uh, whoa, they are gonna raise a lot of discussion. Let's just say that you're either gonna love that episode or hate it. I don't really- I like how he's priming everyone for Reddit threads about, MatPat was wrong about this theory, here's why, and it's a 7,000 paragraph essay that I don't I care about reading. Between on that one. Anyway, without any further ado, let's cover a chunk of the timeline that's a lot less controversial, let's meet Mike. <laughs> William still wasn't back. Weird. Michael knew his father sometimes traveled for work, disappearing for days on end, but usually there was some sort of notice, a phone call, a post-it, something. It's not like Michael and his father were close, far from it, but as a household of two suffering men coping with years of tragedy and loss, there was at least some element of communication between the two of them. They were united by a name and a shared pain. This time though, things felt different. William had left nothing, his absence was longer. There were no check-ins, no updates, just silence. Something had happened. If there was one thing Michael knew about his father, it was that he had contingency. How long See, exactly had he been disappeared at this point? Because I understand he's been spring locked by now, so he's just bleeding out in some restaurant Father somewhere. Was a careful and guarded man. He held his cards close to his chest, and as such, William had prepared him in the event that's a that map. this ever happened. Normally, his father kept his home office locked, but in the event of an unexpected, prolonged absence, Michael had been instructed to enter his father's office and look behind an empty set of shelves mounted in the corner of the room. Rolling his eyes, Michael and entered dead the kids office. there. He never fully understood how William was able to spend so many hours of his days locked up in here. There was just nothing. 
<laughs> As a YouTuber, I can fully understand why someone would be able to spend hours of their days locked in their office while doing nothing else except trying their absolute best to be productive to achieve their goals. It makes complete sense to me. Nothing to do. Most of this place was empty. He dragged himself over to the shelf in the corner, expecting to find an emergency contact list, a family safety deposit box. But what he actually found there was five dead kids. Unexpected. Father, it's me, Michael. I did it. I found it. No shot, Michael. Why do you sound like you're 65 years old? Right where you said it would be. The shelf swung open and he sounds British as well. A giant industrial elevator, one that led straight down into an underground bunker. But but that was impossible. Hidden inside his childhood home was a secret entrance to an enormous underground science layer. It, it didn't make any sense. Bro, their electric bills must have been insane. Seriously, it didn't make any sense. Wait, they're British, bro. They're lucky that this isn't in current day. You seen energy bills recently? They've been like they've quintupled over the past. Yeah, God, they'd be bankrupt by just that alone. That would have stopped the murders. The increase in energy bills. And yet here it was, mapped directly underneath the floor plan of the house that he'd grown up in, lost his brother in, been tortured in. Michael thought that he'd known his father, a prideful, sad, angry man with petty everyday problems, but clearly he'd been living with a stranger this entire time. His father had secrets. Suddenly, oh, they live in Utah. William being locked inside That's right, never mind. Made sense. He'd been here the entire time. Where was he? Here though, was this circus baby's inner? Why the fuck would you move to Utah from the UK? Like, listen, I'm not trying to say the UK is awesome, but if you're gonna move to America, why would you move to Utah? And rentals? The circus baby restaurant always did seem to be a deeply personal project for father. A failure of his that cut unusually deep, especially after that first location had to be closed prematurely due to the gas leaks. After that day, father really did seem to change, to lose himself even more in his work. Clearly, the entrance he had found was some sort of secret back way into the facility. One that required crawling through vents to navigate. His father had been working here, but in secret. Why? And that's when he found her. At the end of the facility, Circus Baby. His father is- uh oh joy, here is. is something was different about It's him. your she sister! Like the, the way she talked, the stories she told. This wasn't just a robot. She was alive. Somehow. It's an m and not robot. not only was she alive, she also felt familiar. There is something bad inside of me. I'm- Aw, come on now. That's just a- that's a- that's an innocent child that you say you're talking about. I don't think the kids have done anything wrong. Maybe kicked a dog once. I can't be fixed. Will you help me? Was this his sister? William's baby girl? But how? Why? What was this place? He dug around some old files and found blueprints outlining the features of these animatronics. Storage containers, voice mimicking, parental tracking. And was that a child in- Parental tracking? Uh, why, why don't you just type in like, child murderer, head slicer device, kidnapping machine. Friend's stomach? Was his father collecting and experimenting on kids? Were all the rumors that he'd heard throughout his past actually true? This is really well animated. They did a really good job on these videos. The animatronics came to life at night. That there were murders this is so well edited. Pizzerias, that his father had somehow been the prime suspect in all of it. Suddenly, Michael's mind flashed back to his persistent nightmares throughout his childhood. Had he been experimented on too? Tears stung in his eyes as anger, fear, and confusion filled his body. Yeah, his get him. Secrets were pouring out. Get him, Michael. He wasn't just a lame, overworked father. He was a monster. Toying yeah, with that's himself. right. Suddenly, everything clicked. He frantically looked around the room, blinking human heads on poles staring back at him. Green eyes, his sister. Blue eyes, his brother. Closed eyes, his mom. All just staring expectantly. These were meant to be human. William was working down here trying to make believable humans, literally rebuilding the family that they had both lost. The small little girl robots with their British accents roaming the hallways of this underground facility suddenly took on a whole new context. <gasps> Were those? Uh, no, no, I don't mean, no. Different guy, actually, no, uh, Steve. Steve, I came from California. I'm a surfer. <laughs> I work for minimum wage at a, at a nearby In-N-Out. Never met you before. A clone? Was William building clones of his sister? They seemed to know him, after all, to react to his presence. They were all there. They didn't recognize me at first, but then they thought I was you. He always did have a bit of a resemblance to his father. Michael's mind reeled as the reality of his world crumbled to dust. No, no, he had to get them out of there. If this really was his sister, heck, if any of these things were human, souls, whatever remnant of the humans that they once were, they needed to be rescued. They always put us back inside. 
There's nowhere for us to hide here. Led by the voice of- Yeah, let's keep in mind that they were made to harvest and kill kids, though. Maybe we should- we should kind of weigh the options here. If we let them go, who knows what kind of wacky hijinks they'll get Circus up to. Baby, he marched through the now empty halls of the Funtime Auditorium. He would lead them. He would protect them. And finally, he would be able to forgive himself for the killing of his brother so many years- What happened? We're in the scooping room now. The scooping room? The scooper only hurts for a moment. Oh, good. No, that's, that's, Scooper, that sounds good, actually. Violent extraction arm? Michael had seen that one in the pile of blueprints. Something about heat rendering the magical silver metal inside useless. In reality, prior to getting himself springlocked and put behind the wall, William's methods had become increasingly sophisticated, with a mechanized arm that could infuse new bodies with a soul. William could finally give and take away- How does a scooper infuse a new body with a soul? What, what, what are you- Caught you scooping a soul? Life. The only thing he what are you needed scooping? were the bodies. But William wasn't the only one looking for bodies, as Michael was about to learn. But if we looked like you, then we could hide. You're putting the, the souls like in you. Michael's body? Then we would have somewhere to go. Michael what? was going to be the hero to help these animatronics, all right. He was going to help the haunted tubes and wires of these animatronics escape. Just not in the way that he anticipated. His sister had lied to him. Another game of pretend. The scooper plowed oh, that's through, messed up. digging its extraction arm into his body. As he heard his bones ripping through his flesh, Michael blacked out. But something is wrong with me. Well, you didn't give him, like, any paracetamol, at least? A little bit of painkiller? I mean, you don't have to put him to sleep. I understand that anesthesia is quite expensive. Give him a little bit of painkiller. You should be dead. Yeah, you should be, not. mate. That's interesting. Oh, hello. For the next several months, Michael's life was not his own. He was forced to comply with a tangle of wires and spirits that lived inside of him. His body felt like an overfilled balloon. Okay, in theory, it, a scooper scoops. It's, it's scooping out the body. It's scooping out the organs. It's making room for the endoskeleton. You still need something to function or else you wouldn't be alive. It couldn't have killed him. So it didn't scoop out the heart, didn't scoop out the brain. It just scooped out what is his stomach and his intestines and it just shoved some wires and spirits in there? Hmm. Begging to burst as day by day, we- Michael is possessing his own skin sack. Ooh. Oh, that's awesome. Did they stitch him back together again? I think he's gonna decompose, isn't he? By week, his flesh began to sag and discolor. He was a yep. walking, talking, rotting corpse. Alive, oh, cool. wishing he wasn't. He was a puppet, a walking shell. And while he did his best to conceal his fate, there was only so much- <laughs> looking at him like, oh, that boy, <laughs> that boy ain't right. You seen that Michael recently? He looks a bit what ill. What a man filled with robot spaghetti could do. The entity in his innards would eventually leave, but by that point, the damage had been done. His decaying flesh stank, turning him into a literal purple guy. But still, even with no bones, even with rotting purple flesh and begging to die, Michael continued to live. That's so- Oh, he's still alive because he has the soul and it's just been put into a, a skin sack instead of an animatronic suit, which means he still must have some kind of animatronics in him because he wouldn't be able to function his limbs without it. Oh God, it's just wires with skin layered on top of it, of a body that he once had. Oh, that's so gross. Every metal remnant injected by the scooper meant that he couldn't die. His anger also refused to die. What he had seen down there in his sister location had rocked him to his core. His father had killed and captured dozens. His experiments had killed his sister and then tortured him throughout all his childhood. He was actively trying to build human replicants. He didn't know where his father was, but Michael knew that he was out there somewhere. I've been living in shadows. There is only one thing left. No, it makes sense that he sounds like that. That kind of shit would age you like 50 years in a night. What to do now? I'm going to come find you. Michael had to correct for the sins of his father. He had to make things right. Michael would burn Fazbear Entertainment to the ground. I mean, what else could you <laughs> it do? It is crazy that there's a Fazbear Entertainment at this point. There's no way there should be one. Michael's strategy was simple. He would apply for night security guard positions at the old defunct pizzeria locations. That way, no one ever had to see him or smell him during his shift. And all these old shuttered locations did need guards. Teenage vandals and squatters were always looking to get inside these abandoned buildings. And yet, no one ever really wanted to work an overnight graveyard shift unless they were practically out of options. Enter one by one, he would take on the job of Oh, this is when Five Nights at Freddy's 3 happens. Time to ensure that no one was able to follow his paper trail. Once inside, Fritz. he could tamper with the animatronics and figure out how they worked, writing about- Wait, so is he the security guard? No, he can't be the security guard in, 
in all of the games then. You can't be the security guard in Five Nights at Freddy's 2 or 1? I don't his think. experiences in his security logbook. Well, there, he would listen to the old tapes where upper management awkwardly welcomed new recruits to their summer jobs, even though he was working there nowhere near the summer. Oh, he was. He heard the gory details of his father's oh, he was franchise the from the outside. Security guard in 1. Confused and afraid about what was happening in the walls around them. Sometimes he would see his brother in the form of the Golden Freddy suit. It's me appearing on the walls around him. Except now, there was something else there. You know what? That actually makes sense within the context of gameplay as well. Because, gonna be honest, if I was a security guard paying, being paid like half of minimum wage to go and work security in a place where there is literal animatronics coming to kill me, nah, I'd be out. But he has a reason other than I need a job. He's like, I need to find out what happened in this whole place. I need to get my dad and ki to kill the dad and all that. So he has a reason to actually stick around. Whereas everyone else would scarper by day one. He was no longer alone. Another angrier presence was also in the suit, as if two spirits were forced to share the same body. And Golden Freddy would attack him. It was aggressive. Its vengeance wanted to lash out at anyone with the Afton name. Anyone who wore a security guard outfit. Over time, Mike worked his way through the old restaurants. The original pizzeria, the bigger, better Freddy Fazbear's. He spent weeks there looking for clues as to his father's whereabouts. And each time at the end of his week shift, he would then set the location on fire. Remnant can't survive <laughs> high temperatures after all. So burning away whatever spirit-laden animatronics that still existed inside seemed like a winning strategy. All this revisiting of his past, though, was causing the nightmares to begin again. Hallucinations that brought him back to his childhood. The guilt around killing his brother. His dreams were- It's interesting that a remnant would even need to sleep. Because at this point, he's not a living human being. He's just whatever is left after you scoop everything out and leave a soul in it. In theory, he doesn't need to eat. He doesn't need to sleep. So why would he even have nightmares? Were oddly mixed with the shrill phone calls of the security guards. But it would all be worth it in the end. The goal was to eventually, eventually stumble across the world. It might just be a coping mechanism. One job that would finally reunite him with his father. Little did Mike know that that day would come sooner than he expected. 2023, an advertisement came across Mike's TV. Fazbear Frights, a new horror attraction. 2023? The awful crimes that occurred around Freddy Fazbear's pizza so many years ago. It made Mike sick. People looking to make a quick buck off the tragedy of others. Off his own family. This wasn't a joke or entertainment. Regardless, he had to be a part of it. If this team was combing through his family's history, they might stumble across something that could be useful. And if his father was truly still alive as he suspected, there would be no way that he wouldn't show up here. Maybe finally. Finally, this could be the final chapter in his family's marathon of tragedy. Mike applied for the job and was immediately handed the keys. Years of doing this had taught him that security guards rarely receive thorough security checks. Looks human. Dude, he doesn't even pass the looks human check. Look at this thing. He doesn't even pass that check. How do you fail the looks human check? I liked how creepy Mike looked. They thought it was a costume on theme for the job. They thought it was a costume. Yeah. When I apply for jobs, I always walk in in costumes. To be fair, I have never actually had a job interview before because all I've done is be a dumb YouTuber all of my work in life. So I don't know. Maybe is that something you do generally when you interview for a new job? You walk in in a Halloween costume because you want to match the vibe? Hey, glad you came back for another night. I promise. It'll be a lot more interesting this time. For weeks, there was nothing. But just as Mike- Everyone in here is brain dead. The this universe is so- <laughs> For years. You're not gonna believe this. We found one. A real one. Could this finally be him? Sure enough. There he was. William inside his iconic Golden Bonnie Springlock suit. Only now it was green and decaying with age. And there they were. A small family of broken men finally reunited. It's been a long time. Mike had always struggled with the phantoms of his past haunting him. But now, all the animatronics he'd encountered over the past months, hopping from pizzeria to pizzeria, suddenly sprang to life. Their burned faces haunting him as he tried to keep track of his father on the cameras. It would seem that William's mere presence had put the spirits on high alert. Ultimately, they were harmless. More annoying than anything else, but there was one that felt different from the others. One that was more than just a mere phantom. The security puppet. If he looked at the cameras at just the right moment- What does the security puppet have to do with anything? Also, if you're going there and you're confronting your dad, finally, at least take an axe. A shotgun, ideally, but take an axe. You can hack that thing to pieces. You don't have to sit there all night and be like, uh oh, shift's over, time to go home. Take an axe. Take two axes. Jewel wheel. You do more damage if you do a power attack with jewel wielding. He could see it floating there through the holes. He could even see its reflection in the water 
water pool down the ground. It would seem like he wasn't the only one there on a mission. While he was dealing with Springtrap, Michael assumed that this one was likely dealing with the spirits of this place, finally setting him to rest. Hopefully this means a happier day for all of us, Mike thought to himself. And in that moment, he felt the air around him release, like pressure being let out of a bottle. The building sighed, as if five spirits had finally been allowed to move on. He had the sense that his brother was a part of them. He rigged the wiring inside the building to misfire, and the dry, desiccated walls erupted in flames. It is finished. Except, it was not. Nope. I mean, Springtrack's got to be dead at this point. He's totally donezo. Also, it's crazy that he's stuck around for five nights. You, you, you came, went out, came back in, went out, came back in. Springtrap the whole time was just like, all right, I'll see you tomorrow. See you later. Goodbye. All right, that's cool. The place gets set on fire. He's like, oh man, why'd you wait five nights to do that? Somehow, through sheer force of will, Afton remained. He had survived. And oh, Mike come on. Find it. See, that's why I told you to take an axe for. Jewel wields. Double tap. Then you'll know that you won. Just setting the house on fire? Listen, if a death is not confirmed on screen, it didn't happen. If someone dies off screen, they're not actually dead. Jewel wield the axe. The new way of finishing off his father. Luckily, the solution would present itself later that year. Not from Mike, but from another victim that had been left in his father's wake. We're talking about becoming a Fazbear Entertainment franchisee. Restaurant no, ownership and management. Something mm. almost anyone can do with a limited degree of success. You are now the face of the newly rebranded Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Fazbear Me? Entertainment as a brand had been closed for years. Will it chose me? Stuck in a suit and a wall. The only person who legally could bring the franchise back was Henry, but he'd largely pulled out of the franchise around the time of his father's disappearance. Don't act like we care about laws now. Something was up. Surely this had to be some kind of a trick, right? Mike, doing what he did best, applied for a franchise and immediately got the job. There was just one thing out of the order. Don't you have to pay a ton of money to buy a franchise? Even if it was like an old defunct franchise with all the kid murdering in the back, they're not just gonna give you that for free. Paragraph four. If you are playing this tape, that means that not only have you been checking outside at the end of every shift, as you were instructed to do, but also that you have found something that meets the criteria of your special obligations under paragraph four. No employment. Special obligation under paragraph four. If you, the employee, sees any dead kids, ghosts, or living metal animatronics, you will report it directly to corporate and not the police. Not that it matters because the police can't do anything in this universe. Even contract he'd ever signed required him to keep special lookout for independently moving animatronics outside the restaurant. Now he knew something was up here. Henry was luring them all back. Rather than trying to go to them, like Mike had done for years, Henry was doing the opposite. He was putting them all under the same roof. He was finishing them off for good. Mike knew this wasn't meant to be a restaurant. It was meant to be a prison, a containment vessel, a locked box meant to trap them all in. If it's not meant to be a restaurant, then why is there all these pizza ingredients here? He says while making dinner, a pepperoni pizza, I think and today. So they could finally end the madness. It took a few nights, but eventually everyone was there. His father, the puppet, the robot spaghetti that had once violated his body, and his sister, all <laughs> hopelessly devoted to serve the man that had once gotten her killed. It was time. He had been instructed to seal the doors and leave, but while he locked everything down, he didn't move on. If this was truly meant to be the end, if the remnant needed to be washed away, he needed to be a part of that. This is where your story ends. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. Although there was a way out planned for you, I have a feeling that's not what you want. I have oh, so that's Henry talking to Michael. That you are right where you want to be. And to you monsters trapped in the corridors, be still and give up your spirits. They don't belong to you. For most Jesus, you, what I ending? Believe there is peace and perhaps more waiting for you after the smoke clears. Although for one of you, the darkest pit of hell has opened to swallow you whole. Wow. So keep the devil waiting, old friend. And with that, it was- Oh my god, dude, what a speech. Is that from the game? That's crazy. And that's it. That's the end of Five Nights at so Freddy's. Afton Legacy died with all of them trapped and that's inside of it. a literal box. All the loose ends have been tied up, and that is the end of Five Nights at Freddy's. William danced around the office. Mike, for the first time in decades, was happy. But William wasn't gone yet. Although the Oh, come on, dude! Just- Please, try the axes, just once. Come on. If hell was open and waiting for him, something or someone wouldn't allow him to move on. Instead, he found himself locked in what? moments from his past. The pizzeria, his son's room, his underground- That was such a good ending. Brains, neurons were all firing at once, over- Yo, that was such a good ending. Why is there more? Mixing and matching all his biggest fears, regrets, failures. What was this place? How did he get- Is this to ultimate custom night? To the silence. <laughs>
Then they started coming. Without warning, animatronics both new and old began to jump out at him, bite him, rip him limb from limb. The pain was immeasurable. Make it stop. Make it stop. William, for the first time, longed for death, an end to this torture. Just as it felt like he couldn't take it anymore, everything was quiet again. It was as if the world had been reset. There was a brief moment of quiet, and then the onslaught began again. Dozens Is this purgatory? Past all focused on him. A waking nightmare that he couldn't escape from. The only thing I could imagine this is, is after Springtrap gets like killed, in theory, his spirit gets put into the fieriest pits of hell, which is like a purgatory where he has to relive his mistakes over and over and over again for eternity. Pain, That's the only thing I could think ripping. this must be. It was his own personal hell, but why? Why couldn't he just die? And then he saw them, a group of characters he never thought he'd see again. Those janky- Oh Christ, it's them again. Started everything. The mediocre melodies. It had all started to go wrong once they showed up. Once Henry had made them. But mixed in with their obnoxious Southern drawls, William heard something else. It was barely a whisper, but he could just make out the words. He tried I tried to release you. He tried to release us. But I'm not gonna let that happen. I will hold you here. I will keep you here. No matter how many times they burn us. That voice. He knew that voice, but from where? Yeah, whose voice is that? Wait, is that? Is I guess it could be. Uh, it could be any of the kids, really. What, the last one? That was the Golden Freddy, the one that they should not have killed. It was the Golden Freddy, because apparently the apparently killing that one was too far. He shouldn't have killed. William thought back. He'd done a lot of awful things, but there was always the one that stood out. Not Charlie, his Why would this one stood out? Not Susie, his first true murder, no. Instead, it was the one that he had lost control with. The one that he had broken beyond repair for no good reason other than because he could. The I, w I would argue that all of the other murders were kind of like the same one. There wasn't anything one different with this one. inside the golden bear that his partner used to wear. Cassidy. They were back, and now they were trying to punish him, to make him suffer like he'd made them suffer. It was almost like William and Cassidy's souls had been locked together, fused by a collective rage and spite, each refusing to move on. But while Cassidy was so focused on taking revenge, they actually did the one thing that would be the downfall for so many others. They kept William alive. Even though fire should have destroyed the remnant that was coursing through his being, Cassidy kept William. William breathing, paving the way for his escape. William's will was so strong, his soul so- Dumb kids. See, this is why we don't give kids any kind of agency. They're idiots. Well, then he managed to put a part of himself inside the circuitry that housed the Springlock suit. And there, his consciousness lay, inside a single circuit board, waiting. Waiting for someone to find him and set him free. A person that no one would suspect. Okay, well, there's no people left apart from Henry that has anything to do with this. I can't imagine. Well, the mum's gone. I guess the mum's technically still alive. Henry's the only one I can think of that's still alive okay, so to this day. a shorter chunk, but an important one as we shift perspectives to Mike and tell his side of the story. And with FNAF VR AR oh, he's dead. Breach having so much to explain, I didn't want to rush through things by trying to cram it all in here. Don't worry, I know you've all been patient. The final video is happening on March 25th. Fifth. That is locked. It is getting ready to go. Trust me. I want this thing to be over and done with as much as you I am not wait Why would Henry die in the fire? I thought Michael was the one that died. Why, why is Henry there? He shouldn't even been there in the first place That doesn't make views, but before why was he just there? Day, I did want to talk about the big Orville elephant in the room Mike's quest for revenge You might have noticed that I was vague about the dates and there's a good reason for that I don't know him. There is no good way for me to make Oh, he says I'm remaining as well. I oh, do know. okay. We know just wanted to kill himself. That Fair Michael enough. Afton is the character that we play as up until Ultimate Custom Night. Mike Schmidt and Fritz Smith, the security guards, seems like a bit of a silly maneuver to end ga game end yourself without double tapping and making sure that everyone else is definitely dead. Because if you're just burning down a building, people have survived burning down buildings before, and Spring Trappers survived burning down buildings before, surely he would know that and want to double tap him with an axe just to make sure that he's definitely dead before he game ends himself. For FNAF 1 and FNAF 2 respectively, get fired for quote, tampering with the animatronics and odor. So weird connection between the two of them, right? But now, look at the phantom animatronics that are haunting us in FNAF 3. They use models from both FNAF 1 and FNAF 2, meaning whoever is sitting in that security guard chair, Fazbear Frights, they have to have seen both locations and their animatronics. And that's not all. Their designs are burnt. It's a weird detail in the game, and it's something that the character encyclopedia repeatedly calls attention to. The burned texture for these phantom animatronics. Why is that so unusual, though? Fazbear Frights is the first time in the franchise that we hear about anything burning down. From that point on in the story, it's like the characters turn pyro and are suddenly setting fires left and right. But for the first three games, nothing ever catches fire. The animatronics are just moved or re 
repurposed in some way. So when did they burn? And why would our security guards see them as being burned? Someone has to have been going location to location, setting these places on fire, purging the sins of the past. We know we're definitely playing as Was it Henry? location in FNAF 6 based on the in-game dialogue. And in FNAF 4, there's an Easter egg where we can hear the phone call from night one of FNAF 1, meaning that whoever's in that bedroom has heard the recording as a security guard. We also know that Mike has seen the nightmare animatronic Wait, whoever's in the bedroom has heard the recording as a security guard? But that doesn't make sense. I thought the protagonist of that game was either the- It has to be either the crying child or Michael. But why- Oh, my, my, my brain is melting. Model. Explain so it to me. overall, there is solid evidence that connects all of FNAF's 1 through 6. You'll also notice how the character in Cycle was Michael? doesn't have a page for Mike Afton. This thing has a page for- Char So, FNAF 1 happens where he's a security guard and then- the FNAF 4 happens, which is the nightmares that he has. So yeah, the FNAF 4 is a dream sequence where he's trying to sleep, but he can't sleep because he keeps having nightmares about Outlet it. Bunny Bonnie, but not Michael? Some tells me they don't want us to confirm how many games he's been in, because that would confirm too much of the theory. In short, this gives us an incredibly compelling and complete narrative. Mike as our protagonist, and William his father as our antagonist. Mike accidentally kills his brother in Fredbear's mouth, which begins our story and sets William down his pathway of destruction. Mike is then haunted by the guilt of his past and is looking to make things right across the rest of the games. In sister location, he learns what his father's been up to and realizes what he has to do to correct it. After failing to finish the job in FNAF 3, he ultimately helps Henry end it all in FNAF 6. It is great. It is a clean narrative. There is it is a good ending. So why the fuck is there more games? Just one problem, timing. Mike's quest can't really start until he's been down to sister location, seen baby, and gotten himself scooped. That's when he finds out about Afton's secret life. It's also when he's gonna start to smell because, you know, he's a walking, talking, rotting corpse. And we know that he's not going down into the bunker until the Funtime animatronics have been made, Freddy's has been closed, and Afton is out of the picture. That all should be- So FNAF 1 can't happen until all of that has already happened. Post-1993, after William is sealed behind- So sister location has to happen before Five Nights at Freddy's 1. Wall. But that then presents us with a few problems. Afton has already dismantled the original animatronics as we see in the FNAF 3 mini- but he's already dismantled all the original animatronics, so Five Nights at Freddy's 1 it can't happen after that after sister location. Ooh, that doesn't make sense. Games. How are those things getting burned if they're already deconstructed? But more importantly, we see FNAF 2 paychecks with the date 1987. That is way earlier than I think it can be. To be fair, Fritz Smith's pink slip on night 7 doesn't have a date, but it's a bit weird to say that the first few nights are in 1987 and then employee number 3 is hired on years after the restaurant closes. Anyway, just wanted to call that out because I don't have a solid answer for it and I'd love- I have a solid answer for it. There is one guy making these video games and he did not have a solid plan like, Oda does not have a solid plan for One Piece when he writes chapter one about how everything is gonna be lined out in timing and how every event is gonna occur. There was a game that did really well and he was like, oh man, I kinda have to capitalize on it. So he made more games and he made a really extensive lore that people really got into, but ultimately there is gonna be errors in it. And that's just how humans work and you're not gonna find a perfect solution for everything. But I will say that whole Afton storyline, the way that has been put together is pretty compelling and it does have some errors in it and they just have some mistakes, but that's fine because humans make errors and humans make mistakes, but it was a cool story. So why the fuck are there more games? <laughs> the time has come for the final game theory. A family rebuilt. We've come far and I understand a lot more than I did when I started. Thank you, Matt Pat, but the time has come. For the end. Today, we're bringing our story to a close by talking about the most complicated and controversial part of the timeline. The part that I've been dreading most of all, the end. The mo I've kind of been dreading this as well. I thought the bow was wrapped up pretty nicely with the other theories and the timeline seemed to come to a nice logical conclusion. And for some reason, now there is a 30 minute theory on stuff that really doesn't seem like it necessarily needs to be in the timeline, but I guess we'll find out. Moment where we're finally forced to come to some definitive and difficult answers trying to explain what the heck we were watching in Security Breach. The last two episodes have been about death. The death of Afton's family, the deaths of multiple children, the death of the franchise itself as Mike and Henry figuratively and literally burn it all down. Today and it seemed like a pretty nice way to wrap everything up. There's no loose ends, and I, I suppose episode, maybe there though, is. And the current end of this franchise is instead all about rebirth, the return of old characters in new forms, and the controversial rebirth of a franchise entering the next era of its story. But Dude, Security Breach looks so weird. I don't understand this. I mean, from a gameplay perspective, it looked kind of okay. It looked pretty mediocre. The characters are like, all right. Did people generally like this? 
Oh, was it not likes? Because to me, from the outside, this looked pretty dumb. As someone that has not played a Five Nights at Freddy's game all the way through. Uh, before we hop into the timeline, due to scheduling conflicts, I won't be able to have any live talk back after this episode. I know, I promised one, I was really excited about it, but I just couldn't make it work with my schedule and all the other guests' schedules. That said, well, Matt Pat, you literally work like seven hours, se or seven days a week. He works eight days a week. He makes style theory videos, food theory videos, game theory videos, film theory videos. As a YouTuber that also does YouTube, then I understand that it's a lot to do, especially with the, the amount of work that goes into each video. Obviously, he has people helping him out, but still, it's, it's a still lot to do. Still do plan on doing one over the coming weeks with special guests. Just uh, make sure that you're subscribed and either have all notifications turned on, or you're just watching our community tab for the announcement as to when He works seven happen. days now, a day. Any further ado, we finally reach the end and a new beginning to our story. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Post purple guy. Uh, there's more to come. Was dead. There is no need for you to return to work next week as Fazbear Entertainment is no longer a corporate entity. All debts had been paid. All assets redistributed. The company was outright dissolved. Even the memories of the horrors that had happened there started to fade away in the public consciousness. The people were gone too. William was dead. Henry was gone. A whole generation of young Emily. Well, and William was lost dead. Their air lives quotes. To the horrors of the pizzeria. All of them collateral damage to the man in the bunny suit. Everyone the company had ever touched was dead and gone. Well, all except- Not- not everyone, right? Like, surely someone had gone in, got a slice of margarita, chilled out for a bit, and then went home. Unless they also poisoned every single person that ate a pizza there, which, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised at this point if they turned around and revealed that they had killed tens of thousands of people and just no one even noticed. They just poisoned every single pizza that they created in the place. What? Pay your child support, you deadbeat! I'm keeping the diamond <laughs> so ring. So funny. I also set the house on fire! Oh, Claire yeah, the lady! Up. She'd been there in the early days, back when things with William were good. They'd had the perfect home, a thriving business, the ideal family. But shortly after their youngest son died, things started to change. William had become distant, lost in his work, obsessive. She had watched him change from this irritatingly brilliant man that she had fallen in love with to a drunken monster struggling to hold himself together. And despite was her he alcoholic? To him in those was days, he was just too far gone. It's hard. You wanted to let me in. For her sake, she had to leave the relationship. And from there, she largely faded into obscurity. A mystery from William's past. A footnote in his history. And that was fine for her. Bit of a deadbeat mom. Abandoning the kids, though. Oh, well, I guess the kids are dead. Were all the kids dead at that point? No. There was Michael. There was the one that went on to burn everything down. He wasn't dead. He abandoned at least she one kid. She wanted to leave that part of her life behind. She tried to move forward, never wanting to hear the name Freddy Fazbear again. A time defined by mistakes and broken promises. Promises. But then the paperwork started to arrive as fast oh, no. payment began to close. Oh no, that's true horror game is the paperwork you have to do on your taxes every year. As a corporate entity, suddenly her mail was flooded with notifications, requests, obligations. She had been there since the beginning, helping William in the early days of his business. And now, as a shareholder and sole living member of the Afton family, all copyrights and trademarks of both Afton Robotics and Fazbear Entertainment passed on to her. Memories of this past life that she had long left behind. Looking at the blueprints, the contracts, the memos, she felt old wounds begin to reopen. The regrets of a happy family that had been torn away from her. William had always been brilliant. That's what had attracted her to him in the first place. But he'd also been too blinded by obsession and pride. He was too jealous, too petty, too unable to actually see a bigger picture. But now- But- in his defense, he was still present. He didn't abandon his kids, the ones that weren't now, dead. Holding the paperwork that contained- He did get them killed. That is true. But he didn't leave them, In decades of heartbreak and trauma, she realized it was her turn. She was holding the power. This was her chance. And one thought resonated in her head. I will put them back together. I will put them all back together. She would be the one to- Is she the one that makes the security beach place? To rebuild the pieces of 
that shattered life. To reclaim the kids that Fazbear had stolen from her. But how? Looking at William's work now laid out before her, oh, she she's insane. that he'd been onto something. Collecting remnant. Robotic humanoids. Digital conscience transference. The pieces were all in place. They were just scattered. Fragmented. It was almost like there were too many ideas going in too many different directions. It was such an important idea that she reiterated that point to herself. There were too many ideas going in too many different directions. That said, there had to be a way to save it all. She just I love it when he breaks the fourth wall and he comes in. You can tell he's a little bit fed up around this part and this part's a little silly. He's just prepping the audience ahead of time. Yeah, this is kind of dumb. Get ready for this. It's about to get stupid. It's gonna get a little silly in here. Just needed to put it all back together. But how? To rebuild her family, she would first need to rebuild the franchise that had stolen them away from her. With ownership over the characters, their licenses, the technology patents, and the Fazbear name, she converted the corporation back to an LLC, a structure for smaller businesses that are usually family owned. Ah, the I think I have an LLC. From there, she would need Remnant. <laughs> think about my YouTube channel. Is. <laughs> Remnant was the key. Clearly, in the later years of his life, William had been using circus babies, entertainment, and rentals as a remnant farm, sending robots to kids' birthday parties in the hopes of nabbing bits of the stuff here and there. But clearly, it wasn't enough. He had, what, like four, maybe five animatronics going out every week? No. It was a decent idea, but to get the remnant they required, it needed scale. Dozens, hundreds of animatronics all out there, all gathering remnant from unsuspecting customers. But what? How was this plan supposed to work? Gathering remnant? That means killing kids, right? How is that supposed to work? That would require help, something William would never ask for. William had kept everything in-house. His obsession with control limited him. Clara, though, she wasn't nearly that precious. A plan like this required partners, people outside of Fazbear to do the heavy lifting. So she contacted- Is she gonna start killing kids now too? DLZ shipping solutions to help build replicas of all the original animatronics. And with field delivery apps being all the rage, why not an animatronic delivery service? Order one to celebrate your birthday your Halloween party. How about a fourth of- We'll deliver the murderous animatronics straight to your home to kidnap your kids. All you have to do is book now and get a delivery. We will include mediocre pizza July though. July picnic. We'll invite Liberty Chica and 4th of July Freddy on over. She would make sure that they made skins for every occasion. Chocolate Bonnies for Easter, Shamrock Freddies for St. Patrick's Day, Dia de las Muertos Chicas. And thus, the Fazbear Funtime Service was born. Is this real? The Fazbear Funtime Service? Mocketopia! You'll always have someone watching your back. Was it ridiculous? Absolutely. Was it a sellout? Pfft. No doubt. It was exactly the sort of thing that William would have hated. But it needed to be done to get enough remnant. Normally, the novelty of ordering an animatronic wore off after like, what, one, maybe two times? But with new skins for new hol- The novelty of ordering from an animatronic wears off after one time? I'm gonna be honest, if I could order from an animatronic and it comes to your house, I wouldn't do that. That's really creepy. But the novelty wouldn't wear off after one time. If I did see that, I'd be like, wow, that's really freaky. The, the seventh time, the, the, the 14th time, time. I don't think I'd ever get over it. Holidays? Suddenly you had yourself an animatronic perfect for every occasion. It would keep people hooked. It would keep them ordering the latest and greatest that Fazbear Entertainment LLC had to offer. And all the while they'd be collecting and returning the remnant back to her. In a world- Well, as we can see, the rampant greed is what brought us this far. The need for money for expansion, for more and more. As we can see, the true enemy here is capitalism. Word, it was brilliant. There was just one problem with it. No one trusted the Fazbear name. The company's brand was still yeah, I wonder why. in the public eye. No one would want to hire animatronics from the restaurant franchise known for murdering children. Nothing kills a party <laughs> quite like the threat of death, you know. So she- Actually, I would argue that it makes it far more exciting. If there's a threat of death, then ooh, it's gonna boost your adrenaline, isn't it? To find a way to discredit the stories that had come before. She needed to win back the public's affections, reactivate some nostalgia for the spooky stories of their childhoods. She needed a game. Multiple games, in fact. They lied to us. They lied to all of us. They told us that the whole point of this VR game was to undo the bad PR done by a rogue indie game developer. But that's not Damn true it, at all. Scott. Those indie games were designed to conceal and make light of what happened. This isn't just an attempt to rebrand. It's an elaborate cover-up. Struggling game developers Oh my god. This is like a making a video game about like the Sandy Hook showing. Straight up taking 
a situation where many kids died. So many kids died. And then they're like, oh, but we're going to make a VR version. Oh, oh my God. Most working on their magnum opus between shifts at the Dollar General. So she found one. Steve just picked him out of obscurity. The right mix of desk. Quite the picture of Steve. Willing to say and do anything for a couple extra bucks. And he fell right in line. As expected, delivering stupid little things with dumb generic names like Mangle's Quest, Balloon Boy's Air Adventure, Five Nights at Freddy's. Bad gameplay with even worse Five graphics. Nights at but Freddy's. hey, he got the job done. People were suddenly talking about the clues inside of these things, searching for the hidden lore. They were actively making jokes about dead kids at pizzerias. Her husband's twisted history of serial murder so had suddenly insane. been reduced to a mere Nancy Drew mystery to be solved. The plan had worked. Freddy Fazbear's was- That's not too far away from like Netflix documentaries on serial killers though, is it? That's kind of like making light of it and making a profit out of it. That all these like true crime documentaries kind of do the same thing, don't they? Suddenly more popular than ever. Things were going shockingly well. Her takeover and reboot of the franchise was full and complete. Suddenly infused with cash, she built the largest, most ambitious project yet. The Mega Pizza Plex. William had always been so visionary, but always thought so small. Have they ever actually served a pizza at any of these places? Everything, it's all based around pizza, pizza, pizza. I've never seen a pizza actually be ordered from any of these. He was careful to a fault. Not her though. She knew that this latest project oh, needed sick. to be big. It needed to be flashy. It needed to be a palace for children. A place that got people It needed to have so much neon it would blind you. Products. So with a steady supply of remnant flowing in, it was finally time. The stage was set. It was time to get to her real goal, literally rebuilding a family. I don't understand how you have a steady supply of remnant flowing in. You'd think the second a kid die, first off, how do you even open this in the first place? That's ridiculous. Why are kids still going to this? I'm still under the impression that every single adult is in on it and every single adult in this universe actually thinks that killing kids is great and awesome and they want to do it all the time. That's the only logical conclusion that I can come to is that they just all want to kill, kill, kill kids. March, it's, it's totally okay. 2035? Crying what? child, her little boy, the one that was the first to get ripped away from her. She'd seen down in his bunker that William had gotten very close to replicating artificial humans using animatronic technology. And so that's exactly what she would do. Rebuild her boy from the ground up using robotic parts. His shaggy brown hair, his favorite striped shirt, even down to small details that no one would notice, like the band-aid on his left knee. William's research had even found ways of- Is, making... is that an important part of this this child? The band-aid? Would they, they probably only had it on for like, what, a day? Electronics that could bleed and process food, making them virtually indistinguishable from a typical human. He would never have any idea of what he actually was unless he was explicitly told. The only things that could possibly ruin the illusion were any overrides to his internal systems. If something were to say, interfere with a- the main character of Security Breach is an animatronic. I feel like that's a big plot twist, isn't it? Cameras that he had in his eyes, or cause some sort of a core reboot to his hard drive, or x-ray his metallic bones, then yeah, he would be exposed. But otherwise, to the outside world, he was just your typical, normal human boy. She worked down in the bowels of the pizza plex giving him life, but it was one thing to build him, it was another to help him remember his identity. He died so young, so early in their history that there was no preserved memories for him. No documentation that she could just download load into his digital brain. So bit by bit, she trained him, forcing him to remember who he was. In a corner of the room, she even made a makeshift dinner table, a reminder of their happier days. The family oh. recreated two brothers, a sister, a father, and the- Wait, why does Gregory look so much like a normal person, but this whole family does not look like a normal person? This is not going to train a kid to be like, oh yeah, no, I remember having a normal family. This is going to make them cry the and piss themselves. The, of the, table, the one in charge, the one in command, the one bringing all of this to fruition. But his progress was admittedly slower than she would have liked. At first, yeah, I wonder why. Simple ones and zeros, then rudimentary drawings and crude letters. But bit Yum. By bit, images of his past life started to come through. Balloons, colors, houses, bears and faces, birthday parties, all. Nah, I don't like this kid. If his favorite color is yellow, I don't like this kid. I'm sorry. Gregory's not my friend. Me. Gregory was alive. As the robot boy embraced her, she felt a warmth that she hadn't in decades. This. It was the robot overheating. Soon it would self destruct and explode, taking them both out. This was the joy that she'd been working towards. This was what it was all for. Her son, back in her arms again. The plan was working. She had to keep going. Next was William. If the family was truly going to be put together, she would need him. And she ah! I would argue that you don't need William. 
considering all that had happened, taking it all into consideration, I think we should come together. The council could maybe decide, ah, we don't need he that one. Exactly That's okay. He where he was, in the ruins of that old Freddy Fazbear's pizza place where Henry had trapped him. In fact, that's specifically why she insisted on building the pizza plex there over the sinkhole. It's the best place to hide what her true intentions were with the entire operation. Digging through the wreckage, she found him. He was right where she thought he was. Oh my Seeing god. The shell of the he was looking better than the day they were married. The suit, though, was not something she was prepared for. The rotting corpse of William Afton was disgusting. Scorched flesh fused into the fur lining. Hollow black. Ah, come on, no, that's your husband you're talking about. You gotta big up your man. Sockets where eyes once were. A smell that reeked of burned carbon and bloody iron. He was no longer flesh. He was just the tangled sinews of a creature that was once called human. How far this brilliant man had fallen. It was clear that her work was cut out for her on this one. Afton was practically lifeless. The man may not have been able to die, but he was about as close as you could come. Wait, he was still alive? Oh, that's dumb. I get because, like, the kid was so angry. She was like, like, I'm not gonna let you die and then put him up to purgatory, but he shouldn't still be alive in the real world. His body would need a lot of reconstruction. Replacement arms and endoskeleton reinforcements were the top priority. Maybe pulled from their new line of glam rock animatronics. She'd have to see if they had any spare Bonnie parts lying around that they could steal. In the meantime, though, she threw the husk that was once her husband into a life support pod infused with aerosolized remnant to help keep him stable. But more important than recovering his body. Why? Why do? You, why does he even need a life support pod if he can't even die anyway? <laughs> recovering his mind. In his current state, he was comatose, an empty shell. Severe brain damage starts at temperatures over 108 degrees Fahrenheit, 42 degrees Celsius, and years of repeated fires had burned his brain to goo. Gone was the brilliant, frustrating mind that had drawn her to him in the first place, but she had a plan. Unlike her darling boy Gregory, Afton had found ways to record his consciousness. Fundamentally, the brain is only a series of electrical connections after all, so why couldn't you replicate that in the form of a standard circuit board? In essence, you could create a digital consciousness. And one thing she knew about William, he was nothing if not cautious. A planner. Someone who had backup plans to his backup plans. And sure enough, there it was. Buried in piles of old animatronic CPUs, a record of Afton himself. I don't believe that he, he had that planned ahead of time. There's no way. You're just gonna plug the CPU back into the animatronic. You're like, oh, it's my husband. Good as new. Wait. When did he make this record? This is very important. Did he make this record after the child murder or before? Because if he made it before, awesome, cool. Family, husband, great. After, maybe you don't need that one. She needed someone to test it. Someone was definitely here during the night. It had to have been the client. I mean, they sent us that stuff in the first place with no explanation, told us to scan it, said it would expedite the process so we wouldn't need to program any pathfinding ourselves. Unlike the other games that she'd paid to have made in the past, this one had a different purpose. This wasn't about PR, it was about getting William back up and running, spreading his virus to the masses. You acknowledge that Fazbear Entertainment is not responsible for accidental digital consciousness transference, real world manifestations oh, of what? characters. She hired oh, is it still the VR game? Silver Parasol Games to scan the boards and Rabbit. bring her husband into the system. And because of the immersive nature of VR, William's consciousness would be able to merge with the player, giving him a new okay, body, makes sense. a new agency. There was just one complication. Don't know if that's how VR Afton's works, but... wasn't as powerful as she had hoped. He wasn't able to gain complete control. The first trial run, Jeremy, was so desperate to escape from his grasp that he sliced his own face off with a paper shredder. What? Did they like screw in the VR headset with nails? What, why would you need to do As that? Captain's followers were reluctant to say the least, but it was the second attempt that looked like it had the potential to kill two birds with one stone. Enter Vanessa. Mrs. Afton wanted a surrogate daughter. Her darling Elizabeth would have been a young woman at this point if she had lived. And Clara wanted someone who wasn't Elizabeth, but could be just like her. Could she have just rebuilt her like Gregory? Sure, but she decided against it because she wanted an actual human mother-daughter connection. Well, that, and it would be ridiculous. <laughs> Whereas having a human mother-daughter or mother-son connection, that wasn't really necessary. The robot one, that's fine. You can go for a B-Tech version on this one. I don't really care that much. Narratively unsatisfying to have two robot kids in the same family. What could she say? William had put a lot of tools on the table for her to use, and she was planning on using them all. Plus, Elizabeth had always been so loyal to Daddy. It was time to give her a second chance, a true choice. And Vanessa seemed to be the perfect candidate to fill the role. Your dad's name was Bill. Your dad didn't play affair, did he? He used to make your mum look bad in court. He manipulated you. I know your mum after she lost the custody case. Daddy issues? Oh, 
good girl. She started as a QA tester at Silver Parasol Games, a VR game development company that was part of her plan to bring back William. But more importantly, Vanessa checked all the correct boxes. Right age, blonde, green eyes with a fondness for flowers and the outdoors. In many ways, it was, was that really needed all over again. Except it wasn't just looks and personality. What really mattered was Vanessa's mind. Underconfident, coming from a broken home, mother. Oh, was dude, this is so messed up. Manipulated. Oh, come on. This is straight up evil. You're like, we need someone from a broken home that we can easily manipulate. Best case scenario, they have daddy issues as well. We really want to make sure that they have no support system and they can be completely under our control. Yes, she would do nicely. She would be the one to save dear old daddy, just as the real Elizabeth would have wanted. I will make you proud, daddy. While testing the VR game, William's digital consciousness merged with Vanessa. Oh, sure, she fought, fragmenting Afton's code into a series of tapes hidden across the game, trying to do web searches to regain control over her life, but it wasn't enough. She was weaker than Jeremy. She was a thrall that, despite occasional moments of lucidity, had to obey. And with Vanessa, it was a two-for-one deal. She was getting a daughter back while also bringing her husband one step closer to reactivation. She then you have like a mother, or you have a, a father-daughter combo, which is really creepy and honestly not ideal. Just had to make sure that Vanessa was headed the right way. The reborn Gregory was an expert hacker, part of the benefits of being an Afton and a of course. robot. So Clara had him keeping tabs on Vanessa, hacking into her emails and trailing her therapy sessions to ensure the future Elizabeth was falling in line. If any of the therapists started to ask too many questions, they were promptly dismissed from their positions. And while Gregory kept tabs on Vanessa's personal life, Mrs. Afton made sure to clear a path for her professionally. With Silver Parasol's collapse at the hands of the Anomaly, she then had the possessed Vanessa bring the contaminated circuit boards to DLZ shipping and the Fazbear Funtime service. More glitches, more remnant, more Afton. But it was her last move that was the best. In a true masterpiece of poetry, she brought Vanessa over to be Chief Security Officer at the Pizzaplex. A true family tradition to don the hat and badge and all it took oh, was that's really messed up. from the top as well as some emails marked for deletion. Sure, Vanessa didn't have relevant experience for the job, but when it comes directly from the CEO, does it really matter? Oh, I just put in a little bit of nepotism. I mean, it's not new. It's a time-honored tradition in the United States of America to do nepotism. You don't need experience. You just need connections. I That's the most American thing I've seen all day. I love Husband, it. Husband, son, daughter. A corpse, a robot, a human. Wait, what about, what about was Michael? Was Michael. Poor, oh, okay. troubled Michael. The boy that killed her youngest. The one that would spend years trying to make his guilty conscience right again. A self-professed protector. While she knew she needed him to complete the family, something told her that the problem had already solved itself. Something had shifted when using Glamrock Freddy to excavate the buried pizza place. I have been here before. I found myself for the first time when I cleared- Oh my god, is he already inside of that Freddy somehow? I have changed. My friends- are here, but I can protect you. I oh no! Me. Maybe it was the remnant that had coursed through Michael's veins. Maybe it was the spirit of Michael living on as a protector. But he was there, somewhere inside of Glamrock Freddy. She could feel it. And just like that, she'd won. She'd done it. Sure, there were still some kinks to work out, some final brainwashing of Vanessa, some rehabilitation of William, but they were there. Finally, all together again under one roof, the Aftons reunited. Wow, and isn't this the picture of a wonderful family? Woo, that, you got the white picket fence on this one, guys. <laughs> Looking real that good. Really, that's how it could have ended. That's how it should have ended, had it not been for a few unanticipated developments. For Is that one, the something was just wrong with the pizza plex. Almost as if the entire building was haunted, possessed. Puppet plushies hiding. Really? Do you think that the place might be haunted when they're like literally harvesting, I guess, hundreds of kids now at this point for behind remnant? Ceilings, behind crates, places that they had no earthly way of belonging. Staff bots with greasy tears down their eyes acting like they were being puppeteered by some sort of a nightmare. Even their sounds had the echo of nightmares long past. <laughs> It was as though Sounds a good, guys. spirit of the past refused to move on. As long as her husband was around, it too would linger. Only now, it wasn't just in one body, but it was in the essence of the building itself. She had seen stories tear of it down. houses Set fire to it. it's fine. getting possessed by angry spirits, but she'd never assumed that it could be real. Then again, in a world of living- Why would you not assume that that can be real when you live in a world where you know that you can put the souls of kids inside of metal Funtime Freddy Fazbear bots? 
years of metal and mind controlling glitches. Who was she to be so judgmental? The whole thing was ridiculous. Why would this be the line that she refused to cross? After all, the Pizzaplex was built over the burial ground of angry spirits, but it was the, the best place to buy to build a pizza place. Something was wrong. Suddenly, these cords were striped black and white, like the security puppet from generations ago. The very foundations of this place, the materials and wires that constituted it, were rebelling against her, against the Aftons, against the quest to bring them all together. Again. And it was being helped by something else, something slithering through the building. Oh, is it the the girl that got really angry at? Afton and wouldn't let him die because she also refused to die. So it would be the 50 ultimate custom night uh, little they girl. Connected, she couldn't be sure, but a blob of living wires could be heard oozing through the walls, stealing pieces and parts of the old animatronics showcased in Rockstar Row. She could only assume that it was a byproduct of all the remnant they'd been collecting. From Afton's testing, she knew that both light and dark remnant existed, one of positive emotions and the other created from anguish, anger, agony. Perhaps this, this thing was an amalgamation of all the darkest parts of the pizzeria's history. Oh, it's the final boss of, of Five Nights at Freddy's. ...housed inside these defunct endoskeletons and exosuits. As long as it was left alone, it seemed to be harmless. But if any af... <laughs> Oh yeah, no, that looks harmless. You're right. The outside of Michael got too close, it would lash out wildly. Even young Gregory, looking to punish the family that had been complicit in its horrible creation. Little did she know, though, that Gregory should have been her biggest concern. That bringing the family together would have some unforeseen consequences. Gregory was normally the goodest of boys. She had literally built him that way. But lately, he'd been disappearing more and more often. That's no dog. <laughs> requests. She knew that he loved playing on the arcade machines once the Pizzaplex closed, being so good as to top Is that the leaderboard zombies? practically all of them. But lately, he was nowhere to be found. She suspected- Bro, he's a gaming mastermind. He's gaming out of his mind. That kid could have grown up to be a Fortnite streamer. Can you imagine that? had to do with Glamrock Freddy's failed performance the other night, when he malfunctioned live on stage. Almost as though the core programming of Freddy responded to seeing this rebuilt small boy. Almost like it awakened something inside of him. She'd have to make sure that Vanessa was on the lookout out for him. But she'd soon come to learn that Vanessa wasn't enough. Whether it was the influence of- Well, yeah, no wonder. Have you seen the size of this place? Of course you're gonna need more than one single security guard to cover like seven square miles of footage of building. Puppet, or a reawakened hatred of animatronics seated deep in Gregory's code, something had caused him to rebel. To rip apart each animatronic in the pizza plex. Bit by bit, this boy was tearing down the empire that she'd so painstakingly built. Freeing Vanessa from her mind control, destroying the remains of Afton in the basement, setting Glamrock Freddy loose as her carefully- Can you even destroy the remains of Afton? I mean, they're, they're pretty convinced that you just can't die world crumbled around her one more time, she began to plot her revenge. She would have to bring them all to ruin. And Bro, that is you your it, son. Friends, you did it. a decade in the making, my FNAF timeline for where the franchise is here in 2023. The year of Fazbear Friday. What happens at the end of Security way, Breach? It wouldn't be right for me to finish without going over some of the more controversial takes that I just handed out. I think we can okay. all agree that this part of the timeline was always going to be the hardest. So yeah, let's just break agree. down some of the major points. First of all, the biggest swing of this episode, and obviously the one that everything else rests upon, Mrs. Afton being the CEO of Fazbear Entertainment LLC. Here's it's why not Harriet, is it? Now, first and foremost, the the head of Fazbear Entertainment is the single biggest mystery that we're meant to solve at this point in the lore. The ultimate guide brings it up repeatedly. Who's running the show? Who is okaying these decisions? And in the security breach memos, we get multiple and she's the only one left. someone manipulating things from the top down. Whoever this is, they are the I, I guess it makes driving sense. forward every other facet of late stage FNAF lore here. They're the puppet master who's hiring the indie dev. They yeah, why, why she fails once, Gregory goes a little haywire and she's like, oh, we gotta burn everything now. The ones relaunching the brand building the pizza plex over the burial ground. So everything at the end of the timeline relies on this one singular answer. Now, as I see it, there are two possibilities here. One, an adult robot Elizabeth, like we see older versions of robot kids in the fourth closet, or Mrs. Afton. Could it be someone completely new to the franchise? Absolutely yes, but in a game with so many returning faces and repeated themes, it would be pretty random and arbitrary. So between these two girl bosses, who- I guess that makes be? sense. Well, Elizabeth I kinda, I dig wants it. to please her daddy, so she'd be most likely wanting to bring him to life. But then, what's Vanessa's role in all of this? Vanessa is clearly meant to be a parallel for Elizabeth. Same hair, same eyes, similar back. I just can't understand the logical leap that this person, the mother, would take to be like, oh yeah, we want to bring Afton back. Even if she was crazy enough to try the kids, the husband? I don't know about that one. If the main goal is getting the Afton family back together, which seems to clearly be the case in Security Breach, then there's no need for Vanessa to be involved at all. We already have Elizabeth running the show. It would also mean that we suddenly have two robot kids running around. 
around, which feels narratively repetitive and quite frankly kind of dumb. Now look at Mrs. Afton. We know- Well, there's a lot of the lore in this franchise that you might think sounds kind of dumb, and you'd be right. to nothing about her outside of any clues that we can get from Immortal and the Restless and Ballora's song. Yeah, dude, just marry someone else. Just get another husband. Does is make have more kids. Every other piece of the lore fit. Suddenly, you can have one of every other type of character. One robot kid in Gregory, one brainwashed human in Elizabeth slash Vanessa, one OG corpse in William, and one possessed- God, you can tell they were like, so hard on this. They really tried. They, they really, tried. really tried their but best. Narratively, it makes everything else cleaner. Legally, it's also the option that makes the most sense. As I call out in my narrative, she'd likely have some stake in the original company and all of its assets. So as Fazbear folds as a company, I'd suspect a lot of it would return back to her. But there was one clue that really sold me on this particular direction, and that was this right here. In the post-it room, the big lore central of Security Breach, a dinner table God, that scene seems like it would take family, so much time to set up all those post-it notes. And not only is she there, she is at the head of that table. The position of highest yeah, gotcha. honor and responsibility. She oh, yeah, is the no, one I'm in fine. charge with William being relegated off to the side. That one scene As he shows deserves. that we have to include mom in there somewhere, and the only place it makes sense for her to be is at the top. Now, there at the head of the table. dilemma with my interpretation of all this. The ultimate guide really seems to point out that the head of Fazbear doesn't want the glitch trap virus to spread. They call out one particular- Because she only got the glitch trap virus with the glitch trap virus. I assume that she only got that was the only reason she's do even doing this to put her own family back together. So it's not necessarily that she's nefarious in the way that she wants it to spread to other people, Email right? And FNAF AR, where the legal team calls a cease and desist to all action about scanning the circuit boards. And even in FNAF VR, we're told that the circuit boards get stolen back by the client, presumably once they realize what danger is on there, trying to stop Glitch Trap before he spreads and gets out of hand. Here's the problem with that, though. If the head of Fazbear doesn't want Afton to rise again, why'd they restart the company in the first place? Why'd they build over the FNAF 6 pizzeria? Why'd they go through an elaborate cover-up to make the possessed Vanessa an important part of the company? Just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It would be the most inconsistent series of actions ever, but I did want to call attention to it since it seems to be the route that the official got- Matt, this is the law series where kids just die in droves and no one seems to be bothered. <laughs> steer us towards. Moving on to minor point number one, the Five Nights at Freddy's games were made by the rogue indie developer. Here's the thing, FNAF VR opens with this line. That's why we have recreated many of these completely fictitious scenarios, lies, that you've been fed over the last several years into a hilarious VR game. It's recreating the lies told to you by the indie developer. And since Help Wanted has direct recreations of FNAFs 1 through 3, it means the games must be part of the fabrications that this developer made up. Also- Oh, that means that the entire th first three games are just lies? Oh, I don't- I imagine when Matt Pat saw that the first time, he probably just broke down and cried. Oh, so all of this is heavily implied in the story of the same name, Help Wanted and Tales of the Pizzaplex, hence FNAF 1 through 3, canon games within the lore of the series. Big swing number two, the elephant, or ghost in the room, Charlie infecting the Pizzaplex. John from the channel FNAF has made some great findings about Charlie's influence over the Pizzaplex. The cables that look like the striped arms of the puppet, the nightmare own plushies that you find hidden across the Pizzaplex in weird places, the staff bots with creepy smiles and in your dreams written on the front. All of these things scream puppets. Plus, with the puppet mask not having tears in the blob, it seems to imply that Charlie's spirit exists elsewhere. She is still in play, and she has an important role, especially in Gregory's post-it room. The doors to the post-it room Charlie was one of the kids that got killed. Charlie doors. And inside, we see a bunch of lit-up nightmare staff bot heads. So yeah, Charlie was the original Henry's daughter. The Henry that was, that bought out Afton, like, when it, the whole thing started. Charlie was the, Charlie was the first kid that died, right? Just to say the least. The channel ID Fantasy did a great theory looking at the post-it notes, concluding that the crying child slash Gregory isn't alone in this room, but rather might be communicating with someone. A spirit, Charlie. Charlie's spirit seems to have pulled a pull Geist. Instead of controlling one thing, she's affecting a lot of little details, foundational elements of the Pizzaplex. And this isn't the first time that we've seen this in the franchise either. We've seen spirits communicating with people through physical writing in the survival logbook. So we know that this is an established means of spirit communication within this franchise. And I suspect that to some extent it might be Charlie's influence making Gregory go haywire. Which Oh, I'd be so pissed. If I was the first kid to get killed in this whole situation, you have to just bear witness to everything happening, and then you're still around at the end. You don't get your peace. You don't get to rest easy. You still have to hang around in this stupid pizzeria watching kids run around and have fun and eat pizza every day. And then you just know that they're plotting to kill more kids. So you just have to hang around just watch it happen. Oh, I'd be so pissed if I was Charlie. Jesus Brings Christ. Then to my final and probably biggest controversy in recent
and FNAF history, Gregory as Patient 46, the evil robot mastermind. Now, I know when I first came out with this theory a year ago, people were mad. But here's the thing, you don't have to take my evidence points for it anymore. The recent Tales from the Pizzaplex story, GGY, basically goes and just outright proves it. In GGY, we find out about a boy named Gregory who's getting all the high scores in the Pizzaplex arcade machines. When therapists start to go missing, it's confirmed that GGY <laughs> is the one that's when working therapists with start to go and missing. Animatronics that's such a weirdly specific scenario. Imagine there's a whole worldwide epidemic of therapists going missing. Now, all of a sudden, all the therapists are like really worried about going into work because they might just start be kidnapped. By a mysterious glitch, GGY's letters are found inside the code. He even chooses the code name Dr. Rabbit for crying out loud. But obviously, by the time a security breach, Gregory is working against Burn Trap, Vanessa, and the animatronics. Why? How? Well, it's not really clear. I tend to believe that something must have happened to cause him to either lose his memory or be reset in some way. Maybe it was Charlie talking to him in his post-it room. Maybe he hit his head. Maybe it was the connection that he made with Mike on stage in Glamour. He probably just tripped down the not stairs, exactly that's it. sure, and I don't think we have enough clues to solve any of it yet. But it makes sense from a story perspective why he'd start off evil on Afton's side and then switch to trying to destroy him and not knowing who he is in Security Breach. And with that, my friends, I'm wrapping this thing up. Congratulations, we are on page Good 40. God, Matt Pat, you've done an incredible job at this. I would say anyone trying to make a theory or a timeline of this entire series is gonna have a hard time and they're gonna get yelled at by many Redditors on the internet because making an entire timeline about a series that was never meant to have a timeline to begin with and was just started by someone that didn't know what other kind of game to make because they couldn't do art properly or they couldn't draw anything apart from animatronics. So they were like, I'll make an animatronic horror game. And then it spilled out into so much more that never really had an overarching plot that was planned from the very beginning, not like One Piece or anything like that. Then yeah, you're gonna get uh, you can get some things wrong sometimes. But honestly, I think he did a right good job. I think he did a proper good one. I feel like I understand a whole lot more about this video game series now. And honestly, I think if they wrapped it up just where the whole place burned down and Michael died and Anthony died and that was it, that would have been GG's. The fact that they have to extend it because they want a little bit more moolah, a little bit more money, that kind of sucks. But I mean, you know, you can have some fun with it. And you're gonna get a ton of views on videos like this. And you're gonna get a ton of Reddit threads complaining about how you're wrong. But overall, I'd say this was pretty good. Uh, the big thumbs up. I love the game theory videos. I think they're really entertaining. And even if they do get things wrong sometimes, it's okay because realistically, it's not that serious. It's a game series that maybe you invested a lot of yourself into, a lot of time into, but really, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. I, I'd say that they made a really good series. And they clearly tried really, really hard. The editing is fantastic. The script writing was really good. There was some emotional parts in there too. So I, I'd give it a, a big 10 out of 10 for that series. And I think it was fantastic. And well, now, now, I, now I know more. So, hey, I appreciate it. And also, if you want me to watch some stuff, let me know in the Discord server. And also, subscribe to the channel. I'm Game Theory.